Hey, everybody, this is Larry the Cable Guy. Check this out. So I'm in my truck driving with my buddy, and we was heading up to the men's warehouse to fart in the suits, and he's listening to his phone. And I said, that sounds like Hermie Sadler. He said, it is Hermie Sadler. He's got a podcast called Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator. I said, Sadler and the Senator? He said, yeah, that's his good buddy, Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley. I said, well, what in the world? He didn't know this. I said, did you know that Hermie Sadler was voted one of the 50 best looking drivers in NASCAR? He said, I did not know that. I said, because it ain't true. <laughs> you never know, though. He never takes off his helmet. But I know one thing. This show, Leaning Right, Turning Left, is good. So pull up a chair right there by your phone. Get yourself a cold beer and give a listen right here to this week's episode of Leaning Right, Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator. I'll tell you what, I bet Michael Waltrip's even listening. He's always wanted to do something like that. Oh, Sadler, got another one over on Waltrip. Get her done! I'm Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley. I don't know where the hell I am, but I'm leaning <laughs> right. Uh, just for the record, I'm Hermie Sadler turning left. You're back in South Hill. Ah, I am in South Hill. At Sadler Travel Plaza of South Hill. Home of our favorite man bag. Our fanny pack friend, Shep Mouse. Bill, I never thought you would ever forget your trip here to Saddler Travel Plaza where you had your complimentary uh, hand blower machine uh, <laughs> encounter last last time we were here. Truth be told, I was just in the bathroom. Hermie was in there and, and I leaned over you know, across the stall and said, I am not washing my hands. So for those that are listening for the first time, haven't been here before at... Uh, Leaning right and turning left with Sadler in the center, powered by Pacematic. Yeah. We came here once before, and right before we started taping, Hermie must have put in these new lower uh, kind of uh, sinks, and I went to put my hand underneath it, and it, it caused a perfect we got pressure. tidal wave. <laughs> we, a lot got, of pressure. we got big and pressure up here. right pressure. into my pants, and I walked out, and I looked like I didn't even use the restroom. I just peed all over myself. And we so got, I had we to got explain, big pressure. I had to explain to you and everybody else, and in the lay up front, that it was... Then I got attacked by a sink. Yeah, but the problem was you went back and enjoyed the hand blower to get your pants dry. I had to do something to dry my pants, and the only thing there was a a blower. Yeah, but you stayed uh, like 45 minutes. Well, we're on first name basis, me and the hand blower, and I gave it my number uh, afterwards. Well, so uh, this week we got a a cool show. Uh, Senator Stanley wants to go back and talk about some of my um, famous, or I would say infamous, moments as a pit reporter on speed channel and fox sports one so we're going to talk about some of my days on the road and some of my um standout moments you might say mm-hmm. uh, as topical there shep shep gotcha. shep gave me a lecture that we're too political sometimes we need to be we got a couple topical. things going on topical. Topical. Exactly. to me before we get to that I, I and i think i speak for shep and i both i'd like to have an update on the relationship status of you and general tony troy <laughs> after <laughs> Last week's show, I right. mean, you guys are not only friends for many, many years, but also partners right. in a business. Right. And I I kind of thought maybe after last week's episode, you were in need of some type of therapy. It was well, a little tenuous. It, well, I tell you what, the good thing for Tony is um, he doesn't know how to access our podcast. He doesn't know where we are. And I named the episode, and for those that are listening, of course, last week's episode was For the Love of Troy. Because for the love of God, what the heck was he saying? That's the only thing I could think of. What and I think I said it in the car on the way back. For the love of Troy, what the heck was he doing? That's how I came up with the title. Uh, but I learned a lot about Tony Troy that I, I guess I should have known, but I never Is he asked. still a law partner yeah, no of yours? He is now uh, retired <laughs> uh, involuntarily. Uh, no, he's still my law partner. I love him to death. I mean, the great thing is, is we can do that to each other. Um, I just didn't know he touched so much doing the fine. Yes, oh God. I just need four that? more years to get it right. <laughs> I mean, good God, even the, even the Democrats, I was looking at a, I was looking at a, a poll where, where like 70% of the Democrats say that uh, Joe Biden's too old and in even higher numbers, uh, one, oh, you want to so Joe else. Biden or you want to put a fascist in there? But it, but it was like <laughs> only 9% of Democrats thought that the economy was good under Joe Biden. I'm like, oh my God, I'm partners with the nine percenter. And and so um, my wife thought it was hilarious, but she thought I was a little mean on Troy there at the end when when he start uh, he basically called Republicans fascist. Yeah, he and really so kind of turned on him a little bit. And my wife said, "You're you're mean on him. You're tough on him." Uh, and I said, "Well, should I cut it out, Laura?" And she was like, "No, no, 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 it's good." But you were just mean on him. 
So uh, I don't know anything Tony about took that. It in good humor. He thought it was fun and funny. He's he's already ready to come back with more Uncle George stories. So y'all have had a hand blower. Uh, where are you going with this? this. <laughs> this y'all kind of kiss made up is what you're saying. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I guess okay. what what a wild. Analogy I was trying to be was. respectful there. Is that a metaphor or a simile well, or an analogy? I was just trying to. Yeah. Now we well, there was no kissing up. I mean that's how we that's how we treat each other. Like I said there. The first five minutes of our conversation, usually, you know, he's like, I'm watching an MSNBC and you guys are doing this and this. And then I'll sit there and rag on him and we laugh and well, we, we, we disagree without being disagreeable. But I just didn't know how left he was. I thought I was having some effect kind of to reform Well, I met him. Barack Obama, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Clinton. That was a funny episode. All these episodes, even though when we deal with serious topics, are funny. And that was a funny episode to listen to. And uh, well, how did these, he, the past, the past two months of episodes when we got back in the swing have just been hilarious. And I do the editing before I send it on to our man, Wesley. And, and, um, so then I usually don't listen to him after that. Cause I've listened to him to find right. the beeps and where you swear Shep, I have to mark it down. But, um, how much do I owe by the way? Uh, you're, you're in the thousands at this okay. point with your swearing, mm-hmm. but last week's episode, all of us were just jumping on the swear word. So if we offended anybody with all those bleeps, it was, we were having a good time with Tony and it was a good time to, to listen to him, and he's full of stories, and he's got many more, and I think oh, he wants I can to come tell. back on and finish up, and maybe we'll do a Tony Troy 2.0. Well, uh, how it, did he perform in court? Because that was the whole, y'all were preparing for a big case. He did really well. court, I believe. Yeah, he did really well, of course. Um, you know, he, he kind of relies on me to do a lot of it, but he went up there, and we we were fighting, you know, up an uphill battle in a federal court, and won't go into too much detail, because I don't want to get in trouble, you know, with the court, but... Um, we were really kind of on the short end, but we fought like warrior poets. We, we did our best and he, warrior poets. he, uh, <laughs> he was very good. We were trying to get an expert in, which was a polygrapher. That's not somebody who's married a lot. That's a uh, polygamy. A uh, polygrapher is a polygraph test examiner. And we we're trying to demonstrate that our client did not lie when he was communicating with the federal government. And, uh, in most times those court don't allow that in the court and he gave it the hell of a shot so he really did well and i thought we did really well we had a we had a point where i was cross-examining an fbi agent and the judge decided to inject himself and undo perhaps all the good stuff i was getting in at least in my opinion in cross-examination and um what ultimately happened was i for the first time i guess i'm either too old to care or uh, whatever but he was asking questions in the middle of my cross-examination and i said your honor if you'd like to come down here next to me on this side of the dais and ask those questions, I'll be happy to accommodate you. And the judge kind of waves his I'm hand sure he didn't appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, it's, it's kind of like if you're painting a nice painting and somebody that the subject matter is about comes around and sticks their fingers in it. Mm-hmm. Um, doesn't make the artist too happy. So, so I wasn't too happy. We got our butts kicked. Well, it's a little different arena from trying a case in Bodoak. You know, Bodoak, <laughs> wherever that is, I you're up Bodoke. in federal court at that point. Yeah, so. in Richmond. A little different to court. It was tough, and it's a tough case. Really good client who I respect very greatly. Um, had a, you know, I, I could go into the case and, and talk about it for hours, but, you know, we're fighting for the guy because we really believe in him. And, and uh, you know, that's how the cookie crumbles. I'm not used to losing that much. So when I lose, it uh, hurts. I take it the Just wrong FYI, way. I wouldn't have brought up that on the podcast as Shep did. Oh, so look, if you're keeping notes. Back when I was <laughs> having my uh, town council residential issues, he had no problem bringing that stuff up and talking no, about it. Oh, we could it, still so. talk about it because we're but in it's South no Hill. It's this, no need. This is your we bailiwick, will be, right? We, we will be talking about y'all's uh, political involvement moving forward uh, later in the show. But okay. turning the page a little bit, um, before we get to the Fox Sports 1 talk about me, I, you've got a election coming up in november i want to talk a little bit about that and re- sure. what reminded me of that you know we had weather this past weekend in emporia we had uh tropical storm ophelia uh that uh Ophelia you good yeah got moved through uh emporia on saturday we were supposed to have the annual uh peanut festival parade right. and Big activities that is what years <clears throat> they in the 30s. No, 60 something 60 yeah um, a lot, yeah. And then they they got moved back to yesterday. So yesterday being Sunday, we're we're currently taping uh, on Monday in South Hill. Um, but my whole family gathered right there on the patio at Saddle Butler's Oil Company and watched a peanut parade go by. And I thought to myself as we were as we were uh, setting up for the parade, and this will be an opportunity to see 
all the people that are running for local and statewide office. We've yeah, got, well, I mean, you got to go to those things. I mean, that parades so are huge. We've well, got parades a, are important. I mean, you get to usually though you, you have two kind of candidates. The first candidate's the guy that sits in the back of the convertible and waves. And then the real candidates actually walk and give out candy and talk to the people and shake Didn't hands. Did you walk when you did a parade? I did. I, I remember that. Um, we got a pretty highly contested sheriff's race in Greensville County. Um, but so I saw our current sheriff, Timmy Jarrett, who I respect a great yeah, deal it's great. Uh, in Greensville County, him. And I saw a lot of the board of supervisors, um, candidates. Well, on this both year's sides. a state election, so you have House of Delegates, Senate candidates oh, yeah. are all walking through. I'm sure. Otto Waxman great was guy. driving himself in a convertible, <laughs> and I told him as he went by, I said, Otto, I would have, for a small fee, as the big Swede says, for a small <laughs> fee, I would have driven you in the parade had I known you needed a driver, And he, but he was hap- happily driving himself and throwing that candy uh, in his Just own car. I think if we could have gotten plugged to drive Otto in the peanut festival parade so i saw well, that, that's usually one of those things where you know like today four people were hurt <laughs> when he reached down to go get a piece of Reese's pieces that he wanted to eat himself from the floor uh, mary the person is running against him i saw miss person she was riding in a vehicle how is that race i mean is that close or should auto win? i wouldn't think Otto would have any trouble whatsoever mostly he's, in the southwest Otto's done a great part. job he's been he has. very accessible to the people always um he listens um and he lives like we live uh, the majority of us in that part of South, South Virginia, and uh, I think he's uh, in good shape, and I think he's looking forward to having or, or having another term because you know you, you've been at it long enough now where you're more comfortable carrying not only carrying legislation but letting people know your feelings about things, even if it's the, what everybody else wants you to say or not. And Otto, I think that's the next step for him is yeah. he has different thoughts on things, but he's been. A little bit hesitant at times to to speak on it because he knows uh, there can be political ramifications, kind of like what I felt, you know, or trying to run for office and have a lawsuit right. against the governor and things right. going on former at governor. the same time. Well, former and, governor, and your, your first three elections, your hardest. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, once you win a couple, as long as you're doing well and you're not making an ass of yourself like some of these elected officials do, then it usually gets easier because more people in the district have voted for you before. They know who you are. Um, they have more contact with you, so it usually is easier. So if this is his first re-election run, yeah. and this is why it's even even if the percentages look good, it's your hardest race to sure. run is keeping the seat. And so I saw all the people for the local races, and for the Senate race, uh, I saw Clint Jenkins, who's running as the Democrat. Democrat. I did not see Emily Brewer. Now, I know what? the— What? The, Wait, what? Well, the, it was postponed. I, I don't know what her—she may have a very good reason— uh, for not being there because it was supposed to be Saturday. It was supposed to Sunday, all that. But <clears throat> was well, he Sunday? You keep clear because you campaign on Fridays and Saturdays and weekends. Sunday's usually a day rest and, and you don't knock on doors and you give yeah. people a rest. So usually it's an open day. I heard a lot of people discussing the fact that, that she was not present, oh, no show, nor had anybody even having the signage hmm. or well, representing so her in the parade. Place. No. Oh, no, there wasn't like the Republican Party driving down with nothing a float or something. Nothing, hmm. which was disappointing because one of the one of the reasons that I was running was to bring attention to the needs of our part of South right. South Virginia, and so that because it's not just about she, she's she's going to be they're going to be some people now. Like I said, she may have had a valid excuse, but there's going to be some people that I heard them say yesterday at the parade. See. This is why we wanted. They don't care. To, we wanted you to run because mm-hmm. our people don't mm-hmm. don't pay attention to this part of South South Virginia. Well, well you and, would think the Republican Party would have had some type yeah. of representation there, not just Emily, yeah. but usually this your seat county is so important. Your county unit usually comes out, and if your person can't be there, I mean, there, there have been parades you can't make every sure. parade that I I can't make, but um, but they've got your sign and you give them money for candy or you give them money, you know, for you give them literature and all that stuff so that you get it out there. You try to make every single thing you can. You can't make it all, but um, it's especially good because now we're, we're in crunch time after, after Labor Day from Labor Day to November election, it is go time. And so you need to be knocking doors, having people knock your doors for you, but showing up in public places, you know, and, and I, you know, look, I've missed stuff because I've had court, but I have court, you know, I'm making up for, Things being continued all over the place, but um, I still try to make it, even though in my district right now, you know, it's a 75-25 Republican, so I'm the Republican nominee. I've been given that privilege, 
Uh, th- this is a new district. You're and and in in the case of Miss Brewer, that's a new district too. And especially the western part needs some attention. You know, I'm in the eastern part of my district in Franklin County. Most of the population is to the east: Henry County, Franklin County, City of Martinsville, Patrick County make up. But it's the most important parts are the western parts where the population may not be as dense. But you, they need to know that you're there sure. for them. And that's, you know, that's a really important thing. And, you know, whether you're, I was at Lowe's, you know, you, you talk to the people at Lowe's, you talk to everybody you can, because they say, don't I see you on TV? What do you do? And um, I usually say I'm the weatherman for Channel 7. And they don't buy that. And then I tell them what I really do. And then, but in the end, you hopefully you've handed them a card, you've talked to them. But even shaking that hand in that parade means a lot. Or giving that candy out. And I don't throw candy because you can hit a kid in the head which I did maybe once uh, early on in my process. I, and during Halloween, I nailed somebody with a Snickers bar right between the eyes. And um, so I learned to hand it out. But you, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. But you hand it out to the kid, but then you meet the, the parent. Those are important things you've got to go to. So, And the peanut festival, it's, we're not talking about some new festival or that the Halloween big, parade. It was a big or, deal. I mean, all weekend. You know, Christmas parades and, and festivals like yeah. that that are longstanding, you've got to go to. And, I, and really for me, Shep, it was... I get, now I go back to why did I initially decide to run is because Louise Lucas, for all intents and purposes, was a absentee legislator for my part of Virginia. Sure. Yeah. And so I wanted us to have a somebody that's going to look out for the entire district, including Emporia, Greensville County, Brunswick County, um, Dinwiddie. Din, you know, Dinwiddie, all these places, <clears throat> and to have this type of an event on the statewide, the the biggest statewide, and I haven't seen any polling information. I when I got out, I got out, so I don't know where they stand with polling. Maybe she's well. It's a tight district. Just you know, I was saying mine's seventy five twenty five Republican. I mean, this was a fifty one fifty two and went both way, both directions. Yeah. So it went for Democrats for like Mark Warner, and it went for Governor Yunkin. So you know that that's what we would call a swing district. That one we have to pick up. So it's disappointing for us not to have. On the Republican side, either our candidate or somebody representing the candidate, worst case, or somebody from the party, uh, it just was a not the best of looks for people that, um, if you're trying to convince those people in Emporia and Greensville County and surrounding areas to, to vote for you. Well, and, and let's hope, you know, that they pick it up because it's a seat we need to have. We're at 2218 right now, so we've got to... You know, seven races. We've got to win five out of the seven just to get to twenty twenty. Yeah. And uh, in the swing districts, that's counted as a swing district. So it's all going to come so down. We've to had effort. a big weekend in Emporia. So I we don't hope, know if a we hope they win in Emporia. I mean, in, in the South Side Virginia, it's really a three day deal. It starts on Friday night, Saturday, or two day deal, I guess. But you yeah, have bands, car shows. Car, it's a big carnival. Peanuts is a cash crop around here, right? Yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah, uh, And the parade was moved this year from Saturday until yesterday. Big turnout for the parade. A lot of people watching, you know, and, and so um, anyway, outside of that, you know, we enjoyed the parade and and um, and everybody that came to make that happen. Bill, I just, I hope the Republican Party of the state of Virginia hears this podcast and understands how <laughs> well, they get transcripts of it <laughs> how important this seat is we talked about it for a year of course during Hermes campaign of course it's one thing that emily's not there it's another level that the republican party doesn't have represent representation there to vote republican well y- you hope that and i know they do they realize how important the seat is and again like i told you in the five to seven you got to pick up five if we pick up four we're done there are a lot of swing seats that, you know, we got to pick off. And, you know, and my feeling is this is a year for Republicans. The one, the one thing that we may have that, again, is the problem like we had four years ago um, when, you know, w- we had it and when Northam was elected was government shutdowns. And the right. federal government shutting down affects Northern Virginia turnouts because they get pissy and they turn out in high numbers. And it might happen again. But it used to matter back then when we used to have Republican senators from Northern Virginia or Republican House of Delegate members. We don't really anymore. But, but a government shutdown does affect turnout. Um, Democrats usually come out when Republicans shut down, and we're the ones that never do the continuing resolutions. That's a discussion for another time. But we can't afford to lose one seat that we hope to win. And, and effort is really going to be everything. I know, look, I've, I've been raising money, but the majority of my money 
I write checks to other candidates throughout the state. Not this one, but right. uh, but the other candidates that I can help with. And we're talking, you know, six figures. You know, I'm I'm pouring out hundreds of thousands of dollars, and and a lot of members of the caucus who are in safe seats are doing that as well, which is admirable because you could sit on your nest egg, but it's not going to help you get to a majority. Sure. And for it's a me, bigger I'm picture. Just, yeah, and I'm just going to spend down to next to nothing. That's the effort I can put in. Then what you need is that candidate who is not spending it on consultants, but taking that to buy mailers, taking that to to buy signs for for people's yards and also for uh, personal appearances and and for the effort of going out and really kind of making it happen. So this election, we always say this is the most important election ever, but this one really does matter because it's going to set the agenda for Governor Youngkin for the next two years. And um, if we've got majorities and we can get some good things done and undo the bad things that Democrats did over the past four years, if we don't, and then we're going to be in a stalemate if one house is controlled by Republicans, one by the Democrats, just like we were for the past two years. And we saw how much we didn't get done yeah. uh, during the first two years of Youngkin's administration that we could have gotten done that could have helped children, could have helped children uh, make up the gaps that were created in education from COVID. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And, you know, we talk about that even in skill games. I mean, what could we do with those kind of revenues and appropriate them in the right places to make differences in children's lives or help them break the cycle of poverty? But if we don't have a Republican majority, then the chances of one skill games passage, I think, is an iffy proposition at that point. And two, let's say it passes with a Democrat majority in one or both of the houses. They're going to spend it on their liberal pet projects, like how to get more trees into the inner city and environmental justice than actually making a difference in somebody's health or mental health or education, welfare, those kind of things, or economic development in our region that really could make a difference. So this election is really important. Well, Senator, we you can't got- be sitting on our hands. I'm writing checks. I can't be at a peanut parade, but I can write checks. And, and of course, because my race hopefully is going to be not as difficult as some, of the, some of these others. But I ran a difficult race, Shep. In 2011, I ran against a 17-year incumbent right. who they said could not be beat. And I beat him by 644 votes, and it was what got us to 2020 and got us to the majority for the first time in like 16, 20 years. Wow. So I know how important it is. And after that, then the races became easier, but you got to run hard, especially when this is your first time up, Yeah. especially in the Senate district. So um, we need them to run hard and run well. You can't just expect it's going to fall into your lap because this is the time where people are either not going to go out and vote because you didn't make them excited, or they're going to be more Democrats and want to make sure that that uh, that they keep the majorities in Richmond. Well, look, you did get one very important legislation for kids passed. Now, you pissed a lot of people off, <laughs> but your porn bill really helped yes. protect the kids of the Commonwealth. Well, and I appreciate that, and I've gotten more crank calls, but then I've gotten, you know, I, I got a letter from a mother, and, and I had it for the last uh, episode, but we were talking about Tony's lefty politics so much, I never read it to you, but it really meant a lot because, you know, and she wrote, and then I won't say her name, but she wrote, she said, I know you're probably getting a lot of heat for this, but let me tell you how it's helping one family. And what she was saying was that her daughter, because of the phone, was a, and her friends were able to access pornography on the internet. And they caught her. And they were trying to, you know, police as much as they could. But what ultimately is, there's not enough times, not enough hour in the day for you to sit over your shoulder of your kid. And she said the only way it ended, now they're taking corrective action. And this is a 13-year-old girl. Wow. The only way that they took corrective action... She said, "Was because I can't access it anymore, Mom, because it was turned off in Virginia." Right. So, um, to have one parent say that it helped their kids and helped their family makes it all worthwhile. But and all the crank, you know, messages they keep leaving. Well, Hermie, not only was it the Peanut Festival uh, big weekend in Emporia, another big uh, event took place in Emporia over the weekend, or it's taking place right now, I guess, and that's the opening of Rosies. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, Rosies Grand Opening of Rosies. They you know, a couple of weeks ago when we went wintergreen, uh, I got an invitation from our city manager to the quote unquote <laughs> nice invitation. soft opening. I remember that, uh, which was Saturday and Sunday, and then the actual grand opening. My wife just sent me a picture of a minute ago. People lined up oh, that outside and around the building to oh, yeah. get into Rosie's for the grand opening today. Show me that. Really? Yeah. And how far is that from your truck stop? Well, it's fifty feet from one of my convenience stores. And about a half a mile from the truck stop. Hmm. Wow. I mean, this is on a Monday. Isn't, aren't people supposed to be working? <laughs> they are lined up. I mean, that's like, are they giving away 50 people? Free lunches too? <laughs> well, you know what it is. Though. I'm going to tell you. 
uh, they know, as everybody else knows, is they give away a lot of winners today. Oh, yeah. To get people in. If you remember when scratch tickets, I was in college at Hamden, Sydney. It was about 86, 87, somewhere around then. Um, they, you know, scratch tickets came out. Well, you were a big fat winner most of the time. Problem is you kept going back, taking right. home earnings, and it was dwindled down to nothing. But in the, in the beginning, they set those machines because they're games of chance, not games of skill, which we represent and fight for and have constitutional protections. These games of chance, they're algorithms, or there's some little nerd at a computer in Chicago sure. or, or at Churchill Downs in Kentucky manipulating the numbers. Because once the machines start to hit, then people start to gather around. They say, well, if he's winning, I want to get on that machine. And that's what drags them in. It's the same way with, you know, like pornography. Why they want the young kids to do it? They want to get them addicted because that's their next audience. Today is, you will see, they will be handing out. Uh, they'll be losing today. Oh, sure. Because they want them to come back and they want to feel like they can win in these games of chance. You'll probably see a lot of social just, media pictures, too, of people winning. Of course. And, and they'll be advertising that. You know, and Hermie said... Hermie said in the last episode, and maybe the episode before, the game of chance is you pull the lever, you press the button, and you hope. Oh. And that's not a good strategy, but today, as we've discussed. today, it is in the player's favor, and so that's probably why they get a bigger turnout. People know they've got a bigger chance of winning. Those are the people that gamble. But what are they gambling away? You know? They're gambling away time. This is... You're showing me that it's at noon in South Hill, mm -hmm. uh, in Emporia right now. They're lined up around the building. Yeah. Are those, those people not have jobs? Well, or do they? Let have, me say they this. said, "Hey, man, I'm taking Monday off, buddy." Yeah. <laughs> Rose, I'm going to Rose. How many? How many people did that? Let me see this. Say this. You know, the debate on whether or not Rosie's was coming to Emporia was given to the people of the city of Emporia by referendum. They voted to bring Rosie's to Emporia. What was I that respect was that. It close or was it? It was close. Three, four points. Really. Um, and the city, especially people on city council, did a tremendous push. Because this this has been our city manager and city council's, you know their their mission to to bring Rosies. Wow. It's like their golden ticket. They believe to the, to fix the tax revenue, the city. Yeah. And do you know what the tax revenue is, or you you shift from your days I in do, town I council? Do not know. I don't either. I mean, I don't. What know. percentage do they make? Is it off of net earnings or amounts played? Or how I don't do they, know. How do but what what money? I'm saying, you know, so it's it's open today. And a lot of jobs have been created in Emporia, which 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 I like, um, all that. But as I was telling you guys before we started taping, every time there's a social media post put up about Rosie's coming to Emporia, ultimately I get tagged in it. And Facebook, Facebook Instagram, you name it, I get Twitter. tagged in it. Twitter, X, I get tagged in it. And it's a perfect example of the misunderstanding or i would say disinformation even proposed by my candidate my opponent, opponent in my senate primary earlier this year because once somebody tags me in something about rosie's half the people say <clears throat> i'm you know, this is why you couldn't vote for hermy because if we had voted for hermy he would have put a casino in a rosie's in every corner of virginia seriously oh yeah and then the other half of the people would say Oh, you can't vote for Hermie because he tries to, he don't want somebody like Rosie's coming to his hometown of Emporia and operating a business. And you three know, and what our lawsuit wait a minute, has been. Wait a minute. You're getting hit both sides? Both sides. Yeah, he gets it both so ways. Either you, both want, sides. you want a casino here in Greensville County in Emporia, or you don't want, you don't anyway. want anybody <laughs> right. to have any fun. So he can yeah. have just his game. Yeah. So, and I tell people. Oh, just your game. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's, that's how I get beat up. I'm convinced. That, that I'm convinced. Common sense, Bill, I, and I've never policy. said this to you, but I'm convinced that, and I don't regret a second of it. But I'm convinced that my or our lawsuit to protect small business rights and the ability to operate the legal skill games that we've always been able to operate, that lawsuit is one of the, if not the biggest reasons I lost in the primary. Because explain that. Because of the, as I said before confusion and disinformation uh, campaign put out by somebody who was supposed to be on the same team that I was. So, and, and the people not understanding or wanting to really know really and truly what you and I are fighting for. I'm not anti Rosie's. I don't think Rosie's is going to be the golden ticket that's going to fix the economic problems of a town like Emporia. Right. But the vote went to the people, the people voted. I respect that they built it is open no problem. 
what I'm standing up for and fighting for is the rights of small businesses. The I guess if I'm if I'm against something, I'm against the business practices of the parent company of Rosie's, which is Churchill Downs mm-hmm. and others that do not want to, you know, and, and so frustrating because they they put out this PR campaign that says we're going to donate to all these charities in Emporia and Greensville County. We're going to give out all this money to to this charity, that charity, other charity. Well, behind the scenes, they're spending hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in legal fees to take business rights away from small business owners and operators and enticing or encouraging the General Assembly to give them a government-enabled monopoly so that people have to go to these, to Rosie's, as opposed to any other place in the employee that legally operates a skill game. And that is a blatant disregard for the free market system, right. for free enterprise, for people's rights, all those kind of things. So, you know, people are just confused. I'm not anti-Rosie's. I am anti the business practices of their parent company that are saying we, we're we not going to come in and compete on a level playing field with other businesses in Emporia. We're going to use our money, power and influence and try to take away part of your business and your revenue and give it solely to businesses like ours. And that gives them a, a, a an advantage, not only when it comes to, to gaming, but it gives them advantage when it comes to them hiring people. And look, they, the people with Rosie's, this whole week has been the the grand opening week, getting ready for the grand opening. So they've had people from Richmond and other places in Emporia training people. They're coming to Tho Show every night. They have this past week. Really? And they've tried to hire every person in my restaurant. Are you kidding Wow. Me? <clears throat> my bartenders, my servers, they're catching my kitchen people out back like, hey, how long you been here? What do you make? You know? And so, and, and then they're topping it, right? Yeah, they're, they're offering because the government is saying you have to go here for this service. If you want to play a game, you have to go to Rosie's. A game of chance. And so, There's no game of skill <clears throat> inside Rosie's. And so while they're there, they're going to eat at their restaurant. They're going to drink a beer at their bar. And th- this is the one fundamental thing that I don't think people in any small town have fully understood why this fight that you and I are fighting is so important because not and that only is suing the government uh, to keep skill games on, especially in small businesses, and to protect the constitutional right, constitutional right of both the player uh, and you the player to have the game. and us and the game itself. Mm-hmm. And, and we've so, been successful. And remember, you sued so Northam, right not Yunkin, going back to well, that, that was misinformation, a whole other disinformation. Well, yeah. that, that, I got half. To, back I had to half that. the people saying on Emily Brewer's campaign, you know. Um, Hermie's friends with Louise Lucas. If you vote for Hermie, that's a vote for Louise Lucas. Turns out I was bigger friends uh, when Tony Troy told but, you with yeah. Louise. Than On a you serious are. note, what we're talking about, but <laughs> you know, so they're saying you can't vote for Hermie because you, you're voting for Louise and she's for casinos. And then, although our lawsuit was against Northam because he's the one that signed the bill, another part of this disinformation campaign was that we, me, we were suing Yunkin. And trying to prevent his agenda from being right, pushed which is through. ridiculous. So it's just a because Yonkin lie. has said that he wants skill games to be a part of the level playing field that we've let gaming into Virginia. Let's let's let small Virginia business owners be a part of it. So I just don't understand why the people that the tr- people with Churchill Downs or the people with Rosies or even the people of the city of Emporia, city council, our town manager. Okay. Why wouldn't they want any business or any industry that comes into town, why wouldn't they want them to just compete on a level playing field with other businesses and industries in the in the town or the county? Well, and that makes sense. Think of it this way. You just showed Shep and I a picture that your wife sent of a line of people waiting outside for the grand opening of Rosie's. 40, 50 people, right? Right. The the main argument of games of chance, casinos, and Rosies has been that skill games pull away from their bottom line because it pulls people away from their area. So are they saying that that line of 40 or 50 people should be 60 or 70 but for your skill game in your truck stop? I, I think not. And then at the same time, they're cannibalizing your good business um, you know, hiring practices in order to feed their, um, their narrative and their store. 
I mean, that to me is, again, shows the fallacy in their argument. To me... Against skill games for yeah, small business. To me, Rosie's, Churchill Downs, even the other casino groups, the lobbyists, the out-of-state special interests, they should have enough confidence in their business plan and what they plan to accomplish. Let's just say Rosie's in Emporia. They should have enough confidence to come in and compete on a level playing field with all the other businesses in Emporia and Greensville County. Competition makes people better. Yeah. It makes businesses better. It makes us keep our our pay scales competitive, keep our prices competitive, all this. But they're they're actually, you know, and it's two sides to these Churchill Downs people. One is their PR campaign saying, we are such charitable people. We're going to donate hundreds of thousands of dollars in the community. And at the same time, after they've taken millions out of the pocket, they've raped the everybody that can least afford it. But they, they you know, again, it back to them behind the charity. scene, behind the scenes, they are spending money on lawyers as recently as a couple of weeks ago, filing an amicus brief to try and get the Supreme court of Virginia to overturn a judge's ruling. In our case, they want to have a, they want the government to give them a monopoly. They think they deserve a monopoly right and what does that say for their they don't deserve they don't think they deserve they demand a monopoly and for three years we've been winning for three years and they mm -hmm. you know ultimately and i know this is the ultimate goal i've been thinking at some point if we keep winning eventually the churchill downs people and those of the other casinos that want to bring you know casinos to virginia would come sit down with us at a table and realize what you and i have been preaching all along the legal skill game operators in the Commonwealth of Virginia is not who the enemy is of the casinos. It's all the illegals right. that have taken advantage of the gray area. Right. So I've been thinking all along, sometime in this three-year process, the casinos and the people with Rosie's, Churchill Daniels, they'll want to come sit down at a table with us and say, we should be on the same team. We should be putting our resources together. Y'all are doing it the legal way. We've got a license to do it with the commonwealth of virginia let's put our resources together to get rid of the illegal operators that that's going to boost the market share for all the other people doing it legally but they are so determined and so used to getting their way right and so used to being told yes eventually and have that, an endless pot of money that they can throw at lawyers yeah. and politicians <clears throat> so far they have state and local they have closed the door on what three quarters of a billion dollars in state revenue potentially? Well, and while we've been operating these games under this uh, injunction. And think about this: not just for us, but like a guy who was on local town council. They would rather have the illegal video game terminal terminals, the VGTs, in here, so they can conflate the two—a skill game with a video game sure. terminal. They would rather have the criminal element in here, and they would rather us miss out on three quarters of a billion. That's just in skill games. Think of how much tax revenue we've missed out on these illegal games. And that is a partner. That's a good partner with Virginia that is willing to, so they can get their way and monopolize everything. They're willing. They say, okay, you're not going to give us the way we want. They guess what happens. We're going to open the door, let all the mice in, let all the rats in, let the bear in, and then make your, make your state a mess. And you miss out on all this revenue until you agree to play our way. And well, that to me shows that they're not a good partner with the Commonwealth of Virginia, in my opinion, because well, it really comes down to, I don't care about South Hill. I don't care about Emporia. Or where, where we put a Rosie's, I don't care about Portsmouth. You know what I care about? What's coming out of the pocket of those players and well, making sure that they dominate. Keep it small, dominate it all. I was going to say two things. The fact, Hermie, that they have not come to the table, to me, tells the story that they don't want to be a partner. No. They want to right. be a dictator. Just if it's not that y'all have sat down and couldn't work out a deal. We've offered. Yeah, that would be an easy times, thing to do. And their lobbyists really would. say no. And then the other thing is, and I don't know the particulars of this particular deal, Bill, but you know when a deal like this comes to a town, there are concessions that that city or municipality is going to make, whether it's deferred taxes, whether it's um, you know free water and sewer. There are going to have to be some low hanging fruit to get them there. So when Hermie mentioned that the you know city government wants to tout this as their flag. That's fine, but the other part of the equation is what did they have to give up to get the commitment for them to come in? Not much. It's just disappointing to me because, as I said, I'm, there's so many lies been told 
in this disinformation campaign for others to earn points politically. Some are going to say, you know, listen to Hermie. These people have invested $29 million in a facility in Emporia, and he don't want them there. Well, I've got more than $29 million invested in the city of Emporia, too, right. with all my locations. But that's beside the point. The point is... No, it's not. It's But my point is, I'm not unappreciative of anybody who's willing to invest money and provide jobs in Emporia, Greensville County. I'm Make it fake. irritated that they're doing this and at the same time using their power, influence, their lobbyist to uh, encourage the government to give them a monopoly on a business that not only they want for themselves, but are going to take it away from the other people in the, that operate in Emporia and Greensville County and all pockets of Virginia. That is not what Virginia is. That is not what America is. We are supposed, and I'm standing up and protecting the free market system and free enterprise and people's ability to go where they want to, to spend their money. You know, people talk a lot. And I've said this before, talk a lot about, you know, right out here, gas prices, mm. you know, well, they're going up, they're going up. I mean, the people, despite the fact that there's a loves and a pilot and in right outside of Emporia and skippers with a combined 1800 locations nationwide, the Sadler haters are going to say, well, Hermie, controls the gas prices in Emporia, which is nonsense. We have to follow what they what they follow. So um you know, but every time somebody brings up about gas prices, it comes back to help me make my point, Bill. And my point is, guess what? You're in Mecklenburg County today doing doing work for your law practice. Right. You drive up to through here, there's a string of gas stations all along here on 58 on 58 mm -hmm. you get to pick and choose where you want to go and spend your money right. if you don't like the price at my place you can go to sunoco or exxon hand dryer. or another place yeah whoever has the best make a serious dry. point but what i'm you know it's it, it's a it's a preference sure and you have that right and your ability to go where you want rosie's churchill daniels and these casinos are trying to take that right away and have the government mandate to you where you need to go spend your money. And so people get it. I hope people don't get it crossed up. When I say I'm against uh, Rosie's, I'm not against Rosie's coming to Emporia investing money. I'm against Churchill Downs trying to manipulate the system to give them an unfair advantage, a different playing field to play on than all the other businesses. And if we let it go here, what's next? Yeah, well, and just to, to make one counterpoint, You've invested over $28 million in Emporia, in Greensville. They're doing it just now. For me, a senator in the Commonwealth of Virginia, or for somebody who lives in Southside, that's more important because you stayed here. You didn't take opportunity and, and take advantage of people in that way. You reinvested that money here. You may have $28 million in, but you have much more in terms of your employees, your staff, what you do. The money stays here. The employees are here. You're not coming in to take money out and send it to another state, which these Rosies and these casinos do. I mean, they go right out of state. They pay the pittance of taxes that in the sweetheart deal we gave them at the state level when we allowed gambling in here. Your stays here. And for me, that, in my mind, gives you equal or greater footing to make determinations on what's best for Emporia and Greensville County along with the other citizens rather than having, again, Churchill Downs and one of these companies coming in and dictating, like I've said before, like my dad used to lovingly say to me, when I want, when I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. You know, I don't need to be told, patted on the head and right. told what to do. We can collaboratively work together, and they don't have any more status or stature just because they say, well, we're giving out hundreds of thousands to the poor. Well, you're also taking in millions from the poor, you know, so it's a pittance. Uh, I don't believe them. Remember, Rosie's came in under the guise of historic horse racing. Virginia was a huge anti-gambling state. We were never going to allow gambling in here. But they said, we need to save Colonial Downs, where Secretariat was born and raised. We need to keep horse racing in Virginia. And the only way we can do it is by having these games, these video games, which will actually be videos of horse races, you know, at, at all the horse race tracks or throughout the nation. I mean, they'll be, you won't be able to tell what horse race it is and you bet on a number and, of the horse. And if it comes in one place or show, you're just kind of like gambling on historic horse races. You hope. Yeah. Well, what turned out to be was there's no such game. If you go into Rosie's, 
what they have is the horse, like a silhouette or a painting of the horse on the side of the video game, and it's a slot machine. So right. that was a that was not, in my opinion, the truth when they came in. They talk about gray machines. They call skill games games of skill, where predominantly you can win every time based on your skill. That's the difference between a game of chance. They sit there and say that they're gray machines because they came in through the back door. Heck no! Like we said last week, they we demonstrated how they came through the front door. What I don't like was the old shell game where they said, well, we're going to play these old horse racing videos and you can bet on them and the person can win money that way, kind of like parimutuel betting, but in a historical sense. And that's not what you see in the Rosies that are allowed in Virginia. And maybe some of that money goes to Colonial Downs. But again, we were fooled. We were deceived at the state level. I hold a grudge for that. I don't think that's fair. And then to, to sit there and have that person that snuck in here under the guise of that, to point over to a small business owner and say they can't have skill games because, you know, those are gray machines. Well, that's disingenuous. And then to go further and say, oh, and by the way, we're not going to help you get rid of the video game terminals because we're so against skill games and small business owners from having these things. We're just going to let it proliferate because we won't make a deal when we've asked them a number of right. times to come to the table and resolve this and to help Virginia out and help small businesses out. They're not interested. So when it comes to influence and stature, I'd rather go with a guy like you or somebody who owns a convenience store than somebody from, from Kentucky dis- who already lied to me once. It's just disappointing because people chime in and I get hit with the arrows from both sides and neither one of them represent my position. I don't care if it's somebody like Rosie's that's investing $29 million or whether it's some mom and pop that's coming in and re- and <clears throat> investing 10000 to try to open up some kind of you know retail store in Emporia. We all do it without a guarantee. Mm-hmm. We don't have all a guarantee. We have all, all the risk. risk. Mm-hmm. And Rosie's and these other casinos coming in, they want to tout their money they're investing, but they they want a guarantee from the government that they're going to have a certain portion of business that nobody else has, and that's just not the way it's supposed to be. You know, Bill, what they could do is settle the suit and then out-compete the mom and pops. Well, now the casinos hey, are not being sued. Well, I understand. They're on but, the fringes, but the government would have to settle it. But but see, they're telling the government not to settle it, not to resolve it, because if they would resolve it, that would allow that. That legitimizes what they don't want. Churchill Downs is inserting themselves in our lawsuit. Oh, however. Sure. Well, they've been doing that for three yeah. years. But what I'm saying is. They were is, calling us clowns. Remember that yeah. we could never win. Instead of trying to fight the skill games, they could compete. They could advertise bigger winnings. They could advertise cleaner facilities. They could, they could compete like you do in Vegas. You go to Fremont Street yeah. in Vegas, it's 50 casinos, how yeah. many it is. Yeah. Everybody gets a piece. Mom and pop all the Everybody big competes. Stuff, right? But they don't want to compete in Virginia. As Hermie said, they want that monopoly. Well, ask yourself compete. a question. Compete. You know, ask yourself a question. Do you ever see a skill game in a casino or in a Rosie's? No, they're all chance. Why is that? They control it. Well, you're exactly right. They control you the winning. Nail on the head because you know what? They want to control whether the player's going to win or not. Here, you walk into, we're sitting right here in, at this truck travel plaza right here in South Hill. Right behind, over your shoulder, is a golden tee. Based on your talent, that's a protected, constitutionally protected free speech game. You can actually win a lot of money if you know how to play the game. You get a card membership. I mean, people, I had a client who was making $90,000 a year playing that. That's all he did for his job was travel around and play the golden tee in tournaments. Because it's a game of skill. And when you make it a game of skill, predominantly a game of skill. You lose control. It, well, exactly, because it's in the player's hands, not the house. And I've said it before. The mantra of this business is the house always wins. Sure. And you can't always win when it's a skill game. And that's why they hate them. That's why they hate small businesses. There wasn't a line out here when he brought the golden tea in. And, and I walked over to the bathroom that attacked me last time. And I saw you've got, what, three or four skill games. Mm-hmm. Uh, the bona fide, genuine Paysomatic Queen of Virginia skill game. Right. I walk by two guys are playing. One guy's smiling. These are truckers that are coming off the road. They don't want to go to Rosie's. They're eating your sandwiches. Your pork chop uh, sandwich smells good, by the way. Yeah. And uh, and they're smiling. And the, and you know what? They're enjoying the games. I talk to players all the time. Yeah. We're like uh, those other things are crap because you don't have any control. If they know how to play the game, they win. And that's what the casinos hate the most is that it's in the it's in the control of the player. The roulette wheel is never in control of the player. No. The player doesn't control the marble where it drops. That's always chance. This game, skill games, are in control of the player. That's what the casinos can't stand. So, And just to go back to put a button on this, I decided to run because 
I felt like we needed somebody from this area to stand up and truly be a leader and not be, I know as a politician, this is not the, not to be bought and paid for. No, no, you're right. I'm not bought That's what I thought we needed. And in trying to do that, I had people within politics, even on the same party that I was trying to represent, that were so concerned about the fact that I might get elected and not be somebody that they could dictate control. or tell or control, control what to do. Kind of like they the throw all the these in the players. So here I'm sitting right here in South Hill. Rosie's is opening in Emporia. And depending on who you ask, I'm either I want casinos in every corner of Virginia or I don't want anybody doing business in Emporia because I'm selfish. And neither one of them are true. I'm simply standing up and fighting for the Constitution, for small businesses and their rights. And a level playing field is what we've said all along. Right. And only a few people are willing, uh, are willing to acknowledge that. And that is why, and we've talked about this and even chuckled about it some, that is why that I will never run for a political office ever again because you're going to break chef's heart he's expecting you to it's going to cost me a bit (laughs) the difference between and i say this respectfully uh i think i can safely say y'all both when you were doing your thing with town council and and senator with you in the senate y'all enjoy helping people but y'all also like politics i think y'all like yes the inner workings of making the sausages all as y'all yeah not all so I'm different but in yeah. that and I wanted to game. be a help, but I didn't like politics before I started, and I don't like politics now. And I got chewed up and spit out in some different ways trying to do the right thing in my view. And so the reason, you know, I can safely say I'm out because I stepped up, gave people a choice. They made a different choice. And so they can move on with that, whereas I really and truly think y'all – enjoy the you know the the business of politics and i don't chef enjoys late guest and more but <laughs> who would? well he can say what he look who the wouldn't? last couple of weeks that we've been taping podcast he's been off town council how long a month a month but Six every weeks. time i'm around you you're talking to somebody about it yeah you're texting somebody about yeah, it i am you're worried I, about what's happening next yes and so, i am you're watching some of the things that you've done now unravel and be some, taken back but i think we're going to be okay actually the new town manager <laughs> starts today <laughs> starts just today so yeah. what a great day for south hill i think the the future has never looked bright well you're you know i'm i'm now the only elected official on this podcast uh, if and if you know the people choose me in the seventh Senate district, I'll be again for another four years. We've heard from Hermie now say, yeah, and I and I've always said never say never, but that sounded like a pretty good never to me that he will no, not. It's never for me. I can promise you that. Not Look, even at the local level. No, nope. I mean if somebody asked you nope. to be on the city council of within Emporia, two you'd weeks say no. after my last uh, election, the primary, and it's not really that I lost, Bill. It's how I learned sure, politics it worked. and my opponent and other people within the party that I was trying to represent, even some of the people that encouraged me to run, knowing how important this seat was going to be yeah. and how tight this race was going to be, it came to a point where they started thinking about, how is this going to affect me? Not, is this going to be the best for the party? And can Hermie, does Hermie have a better chance to win the general? Or it came down to, Wow, if I if Hermie gets elected, I'm not sure he'll vote for me to be in power. I'm not sure if he'll go along with this. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if he'll go along with that. And that became their priority nah, more so just, than, yeah, than internally. You're saying yeah, those right. that are already they there. Right. The I'm gonna get a be in the Senate Republican yeah. Caucus. Yeah, and you, and you make a good point. And then it's not about you anymore. It's about them. That's right. And it's not about the constituents anymore. Like you said, it's about them because they're trying to hold on to power or get that chairmanship. Uh, it's a different world, and you know. I can't say that local politics is any better. It to me, though, what I will say, you know, and I've said this to you privately, is um, not often, you know, one politics and campaigns are the 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 edge of insanity, but not often, too, does anyone in a win or lose situation walk away with their character and integrity intact. I can certainly say, without equivocation, Hermie, you did not play the game like they wanted. Correct. You maintained your character during all of that. You maintained your integrity. And as my father said, those are the most important things that you have that no one can take from you. But once you give away, you never get back. So true. bravo to you for that effort. Bravo for having the courage to do it. 
but I lost a lot of faith in my party. I mean, we went a couple of weeks where I couldn't tape because I was so mad and I'm still really mad. And, uh, and you know, we need to get that majority back because the minority sucks. The difference is palpable and, and, and Virginia is too important to lose uh, to Northern Virginia liberals. But, um, and I would rather have you there, but I would not have wanted you to be there if you had played the game like they played without the character integrity necessary uh, for any human being my uh, opponent, to maintain who they are as people. Unfortunately. Because you can lose it when you get elected. Oh, and you yeah. see it. Once you get my power opponent, too, you're drunk with it and you can throw away that character integrity then you're and, it's and it's gone. And it's oh, gone. No, you're effective for certain people. You're not effective well, for all people. Correct. And my primary opponent accepted so much money and had so many people come to her aid to bail her out at the end of our campaign. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. She can do nothing. She She has... She is. You mean she spent it all in the primary? I'm saying no. I'm saying oh, she's she's beholden. She's beholden. She, she can't. Okay. She can't be the people first, and that's and I hate that for the people of our. I hate it for district. Her. That's in case the truth. I mean, I oh, don't yeah. know it to be, but I'll take your word for it because you're closer to the fire than I am. But um, but again, that seat is so important. The 17th Senate district seat. If we lose that seat as Republicans, it's going We have a lot harder road. We got to almost run the table after that. And, um, and that tough. makes it tougher because you know what? It's, it's not just for the person who's running. It's not for the person that gives them money. It's for the people that you vote, that vote for you. And even the ones that don't, because it's about the region that you represent rather than the status that you gain by being called Senator or delegate or anything like that. And so, you know, I hope, I hope the 17th goes Republican, but, um, I hope a lot, <laughs> I hope every district goes Republican. Um, but we've got a, we've got a, tough road ahead of us and i can tell you right now because i was on the phone coming over here we're getting outspent right now outraised by about six and a half million dollars from the democrats they're getting money poured in dark money coming in from um, you know these packs that are unaccountable um to the tune of six million more than we've raised and we got a governor in the mansion who's raised three or four million dollars he's got to get out the vote early vote program he's been pouring his heart and soul into it um but we always get outspent I mean, I, I guess more millionaires and billionaires are Democrats than they are Republicans, but, um, but we're always seem to be in a deficit when it comes to money. Um, but you know, money doesn't vote. The person pulls the lever sure. and it's getting people out to vote. I know in my area, Southwest, Southside, Virginia, we were the ones that turned out in mass and got young and elected. What I've been always arguing when I go around is we have to do it every year because that cancels out the population of Northern Virginia. And suddenly we're flexing our muscles and, and the state will start to turn and pay more attention to us. That's, I guess, the same for Suffolk to Emporia Greensville in this area, Brunswick in this 17th Senate district, is that unless they come out in mass and really demonstrate that they are a political force like Southwest Virginia did and Southside Virginia did in the Roanoke Valley, then you continue to get ignored by the person that gets elected in the more populated part of the district. I live in the more populated part, part of the district. But the most important, important parts of my district are Grayson County, Carroll County, Galax, Wythe County, and way out west, um, because they're the ones that turn out too. And when they turn out in force with the eastern parts, we can beat Democrats statewide every time. Well, in Hermes' race, I think you won Dinwiddie, Brunswick, Greensville, City of Emporia. He won half, if not more, of the different voting precincts. But he lost on the population because of Suffolk and Isle of Wight, yeah. I guess, is really what cost him. So to your point, you've got to bring awareness to those other areas to really be able to bring it home. And, you know, Hermie, talking about misinformation, I know not long ago, it was a post up about you had bought Shoney's, a, a, a building down in Emporia, and you were keeping other restaurants from opening up in Emporia because of the truck stop and your convenience stores. And that turned out to be 100% false. Yeah, there was a campaign put up and supported by uh, people that were planted to put it, information on social media as a Shoney's building right across the street, basically from uh, our truck stop facility in Emporia. And the rumor basically was Hermie bought the Shoney's building just simply to keep Carolina Barbecue from moving keep into vacant. that <laughs> building, where the whole time... That's smart business, actually. There was a for sale sign in front of that building the entire time. And so I'm, I, I could only say to people, wow, that's not true. I right. said, but if you don't believe me, number one, you could go to the clerk's office. If there had been a transaction, it would be recorded. You could go see it. But you don't even have to do that. Just ride by Shoney's. 
there has been a sign up in front of that building for three years that it's for sale. And I never walked in the building, never looked at it, never made an offer on it, don't want it. And a couple of weeks ago, long after my primary uh, was over, it uh, it became knowledge, public knowledge that um, some people that run a Mexican restaurant in Emporia had come to some kind of terms to lease that facility, uh, lease that building from the owners, and they're currently remodeling to move sure. in to open up a Mexican restaurant. So now that after the fact, all these truths are coming out and different things. and um, But never let that get in the way of a good lie. Right? Never get let, exactly right. I mean, that's amazing to me. But people will do that. It's to what, and, and the other thing is, it's to what degree they'll go. But it's the fact that so many people nowadays are gullible that are willing to take anything as the God. Well, they, don't want to, they don't want to spend five minutes to go try to right, find out the truth or verify it. Mm-hmm. It's easy just to pile on on social media and say, with it, run yeah. with it. But look, um, what do you say we take a short break? Let's do that. And then we'll come back and we'll have a discussion. Yeah, I got uh, a lot of questions. You got some I want to talk stories. to you about uh, my first ever NASCAR TV gig and how it happened. We can yeah. talk about that. And then some of the you got great uh, stories funny there. moments that we had uh, on Speed Channel and uh, Fox Sports 1. We'll do that when we come back. And we're going to bring in some of the cu- those cuts. We're going to play them for people. And we're also going to talk about it. It should be a good time. I bet I know where you're going during this break. I'm not going to the bathroom and wash my hands, I'm going to tell you that. I'm going to get something on my pants. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Hi, folks. This is Hermie Sadler. Thanks for listening to our all-new podcast, Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator. I hope you are enjoying the show as much as Senator Stanley and I enjoy bringing it to you. Whether you're a family traveling together or a truck driver hauling freight up and down the highway, I hope you will take the time to visit one of our Sadler Travel Plaza locations in Virginia and North Carolina. Sadler Travel Plaza locations are licensed dealer locations for pilot travel centers. We also carry Shell Motiva Petroleum products for our four-wheel friends. We pride ourselves on providing one-stop shopping for service, food, and entertainment. Our food options include Five Guys Burgers and Fries, Quiznos, Dairy Queen, Hermie Sadler's Faux Show Bar and Grill, Victory Lane Restaurant, Hunt Brothers Pizza, Dunkin' Donuts, and much, much more. Our locations include Sadler Travel Plaza in South Hill, located off I-85 at Exit 12. The Sadler Travel Plaza of Emporia, which is conveniently located on Exit 11B off I-95. And Sadler Travel Plaza on Highway 58 in Suffolk. We also have our North Carolina location, Sadler Travel Plaza in Dunn, North Carolina. That's exit 75 off I-95. We appreciate all of our customers. And Bill and I appreciate you listening to Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator, powered by Pacematic. Hey, this is Bill Stanley, Hermie Sadler's sidekick on this podcast. When I'm not in Richmond at the Capitol or doing this podcast, my real job for the past 27 years is as a trial attorney with the Stanley Law Group. Here at the Stanley Law Group, we represent our clients in every courthouse in the Commonwealth. No problem is too small for us to solve. No case is too big for us to win. Whether it's criminal charges, traffic offenses, civil disputes, litigation matters of any sort, we handle it all. We make sure that we treat every client like family because they are to us. Your problem is our problem. Your success is our success because we hate to lose more than we love to win. And believe me, we win a lot. Don't believe me? Go ask Hermie. I'm his favorite lawyer, and he hates lawyers. So give us a call at 540-721-6028 and let us help you. Or visit our website at www.vastanleylawgroup.com. That's www.vastanleylawgroup.com. At the Stanley Law Group, we'll make sure we're the lawyers that you swear by and not at. And we're back. I'm Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley. I now know where the hell I am. <laughs> I'm in South Hill, and I'm leaning right. Happy to be at Saddle Travel Plaza of South Hill today. I came up earlier today. We had uh, our South Hill location and our Emporia Saddle Travel Plaza location. We were notified that they both qualified as diamond dealer status wow. for Pilot Flying J. What does that mean? means they were ranked in the top 10 in the country by truck drivers for overall service experience. Right here. Right. South Hill was like number nine in the country. Our Emporia location, Saddle Travel Plaza of Emporia, 
was ranked number one in the nation. Wow. wow. Congratulations. On pilot Flying J. That's, and how many Pilot Flying Js are there? Thousands. That's pretty big. Number to one. have two? And see, Plus number two one. Two in the top ten and our location, wow. Sadler Travel Plaza of Emporia, uh, ranked by the drivers. The drivers do it. Right. Uh, ranked number one. And um, so congratulations to Ray Sanders in Emporia and Carl Sassel that operates this location in South Hill. They will... Two of our locations in the top 10 in the country for diamond dealer status awesome. with Pilot Flying J. And now when uh, Rosie steals all your employees, do you think you'll have a dip there next year, or do you think <laughs> you think it'll be uh, the same? Can you hear this? Oh, well, <laughs> that was You kind of turn it up. up. <laughs> <laughs> Look, don't mess up Bill's uh, break. He came back with a big smile on his face. We all know where he went during the break. Mm-hmm. I went to go talk to that uh, the blow dryer. In the bathroom. Um, so so anyway, we've got a race coming up. Sadler Stanley Racing, of course. We've got we a couple the of open wheel modifieds in the Smart Series. But we're also, this upcoming weekend, you'll hear this before the race, Saturday night they return to the, the historic track at North Wilkesboro. North Wilkesboro where, Speedway. Where we uh, broke the seal by having the winning open wheel modified. First time uh, that the rubber hit the road there in what, 25, 30 years? Yeah. Ryan Newman. People talk about all these other things, revitalizing the Speedway, all the... We won the first official race back on the Speedway with Ryan Newman was, in the Sadler Stanley Race and Pace Matic car. Bad, I guess. At North had Wilkes the car Burrow on the elevator, year. elevator race to the top. And uh, in fact, in fact, uh, we have the audio uh, from Ryan Newman when he won, uh, when he was interviewed right there after his car was up on the elevator. When we were celebrating, I was sunburned. I looked like a lobster because Hermie had me walking around the track like that morning for about four or five laps we did. And uh, the sun was hot. It was so dang hot. That was when the... I didn't think that was from the sun. That, it was from the sun. But And that's the shitter's full story that we've told before where I had to get the pump out. My wife was mad at me. Uh, but it was a great race and a great historic moment. And as Hermie said that night, and I'd lost my voice, there'll never be another number one race like this. There'll yeah. never be another first race back. So this weekend's we a big weekend for us. We've been off a little bit. Mother Nature has been... Horrible. Really wreaking havoc on. She should get the Smarty Trophy. <clears throat> the yeah, championship. she's 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 undefeated. But now we got to make sure we clarify the race at North Wilkesboro this time around is a NASCAR sanctioned race, Whelan Tour sanctioned race at North Wilkesboro, and then we turn right around on Sunday afternoon with the Smart Tour and go back to Motor Mile uh, and race both of our cars, Ryan Newman and Bobby Labonte. So they will both be racing at North Wilkesboro on Saturday night. And both racing at Motor Mile on Sunday in this Smart Series. So a lot of racing for both of our teams this weekend. And uh, we hope to get back to Victory Lane. We won last year at North Wilkesboro. Last time we were at Motor Mile, we finished second. Had a good car that night. Yep. So now we're taking two cars. And we have tested both tracks. We tested at North Wilkesboro about a month ago with Ryan Newman. And then last Wednesday, uh, kind of off the cuff, not even sure I even told you about it. Nope. But uh, Ryan Newman and the team, <laughs> he just wrote the check. We uh, we snuck off to uh, Motor Mile and got a test in with Ryan Newman at Motor Mile. Oh, that's great! And yeah. now he ran that SRX this season. He did both Bobby and he did, but that's mm-hmm. in the SRX car, which is but, different. You know, than we Oval. we we want to win for Pacematic. We want to win for our team, and so we've we spent a lot of time, effort, and money to go test at North Wilkesboro and to go test at Motor Mile to hopefully give us a better opportunity to, to win one of these races now, this weekend. Did you go to the test at Motor Mile? I did. How did it look? Seriously? Yes. You drove past my house and you didn't tell me you were going. I did. You didn't stop. You weren't there. <laughs> you I run the podcast. Because I had been talking to you about where you were. You run the pod. He runs the race team. Wait a minute. This was while I was in Richmond? I don't remember. Okay. Last Wednesday. See how tight this organization. You had a with. federal court case last Wednesday yeah, with no, General Troy. Been, yeah, I would not have been there. But uh, how'd the test go? It went good. Okay. We wanted to get, even though Ryan had been to Motor Mile and SRX, and even though our guys had been to Motor Mile, you know, before with the Stanley Saddler Stanley Racing cars, I wanted to get Ryan in our car in the seat and get some practice in. So the, they had a productive day. That's good. Now. You and I, well, right now I'm trying to figure out whether we're going to go to uh, Wilkesboro because it's a Saturday race there, Saturday night race there, and then a Sunday afternoon race. You can still get tickets at the Smart Series Sunday. They're available out at the Motor Mile. It's Pulaski Motor Speedway now, but uh, right outside of Radford, it's a great track, fast track. should be a really good race. Plus, it's Sunday afternoon, so you don't have to you know be there all night to do it. 
So we're trying to figure out whether we can get the RV down to Wilkesboro and then turn around early Saturday, uh, Sunday morning and drive to Motor Mile. So we may just camp out at Motor Mile, skip Wilkesboro, watch Wilkesboro on the, uh, on the TV and the RV while we're sitting there at Motor Mile waiting for the team to come back up. Still trying to decide my son Chandler is absolutely wants to do both things, but you know, uh, we've got a lot of important things coming up. Uh, Pace and uh, a lot of their teams, um, Michael Pace and his wife are coming with their friends. So we want to show them a good time. We got the fan zone set up. So if you're listening to this, motor mile. motor mile, we'll have the Sadler Stanley racing and the smart series fan, t- uh, fan zone where you can come in and win t-shirts and cups. And, and we educate cool. you about uh, what a skill game is and where you can find them right around the motor mile track. So it should be very eventful. Hermie's going to be there signing autographs. We'll get, try to get Ryan up there and Bobby I think up there. It, Ryan Newman, you know, the last time we raced was down at Carteret and he showed up. God, that was a long time ago. Had never been to Carteret before. Had never turned a lap on the track and flew over from Darlington to get to Carteret, hopped He's in the car with no practice, qualified second. Pretty damn good. And finished second. Yeah. So I figured if we give him a little bit of practice, we'll Lord put him over the top. Yeah, yeah, he'll be he'll be lapping people. So what yeah, time he ran the fan zone and then came over from Darlington and ran in Carteret. That was what time does the fan zone get going? So all the fan listeners. Fan zone, if the race starts at three, we're gonna start up around noon when people okay. start filtering in. Uh, you can uh, play for prizes, you know. We have skill games, which are not the video skill games that we're talking about. And if you want to go, Shep, I'll come right through here yeah. and pick you up. There you go. And and what we do is, it's like, um, you know, it's it's you, you play something, you can win a t-shirt with skill games and, and our team on it. Uh, it's a great t-shirt with, with a race car on it. You get to see Alan Cups Joseph. that you can pour your oh, beer he's into. Be that. It's Alan well, that's worth the trip. Alan Joseph, Joseph's going to be there. Alan Joseph will be on the corporate jet. Did you see that picture he sent us last night? Of his little... Poodle. A redneck aquatic center? Yeah. See, so I have a redneck aquatic center, which is above a ground pool, man of the people. <laughs> you should have seen this beautiful a tropic pool. And then he had a what do you poodle call those wearing pools? my hat. The water's all the way up to the top all the time. The infinity and, pool. Infinity. He's got yeah. an infinity pool. I mean, his lounge chairs are probably five chairs grand in, a piece. In the water. So you saw that picture. I saw the picture. Big curvy thing. It took I'm not into text, that but I saw the picture. Yeah. And then he had the poodle wearing the Stanley Logger hat backwards. That's was pretty and, cool. Uh, I, ain't, I got an above ground pool and I ain't got no poodle. But Alan Joseph, once again, you know, he's outclassing everybody. Well, I'll be able to ask him what he what his official job title well, we asked is if I'm there. The CEO of the company <laughs> in Wintergreen, what the, what his official job title was, and we couldn't really Well, yeah. he hangs out with Michael Pace. Right. That's what we got. Right. Accelerator, I thought it was yeah. the but what do you accelerate? I don't know what that means. Well, but. he's got what, four or five tiki bars and mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean And the man holds the record in the uh, Guinness book of world records for being the only human being that's run over himself with his own car there you go he told us that story. while illegally <laughs> dumping his trash and somebody yeah, else is illegally dumping trash in the back driving of a, a massage parlor or was it a Vietnamese range rover massage. or it was it was like Escalade? a tahoe or escalate it, was yeah, it wasn't big. a ta- it wasn't a basic tahoe no it was something big no no nothing's basic about what he it, it, it was either range rover or um or escalate. If you haven't met that. Alan Joseph, you got to come out to the Motor Mile and meet Alan Joseph. It's it's like meeting one of those characters that you'll never forget, you know. And he's one of them. I mean, it's like more. He's commitment. so nice they gave him a first name twice, Alan and Joseph. There you go. You won't understand what he's saying. I can no, promise. That's you. part of the charm. Uh, what yeah. do you want to know about my TV? So career? so we're getting ready. We're talking about what's coming up. Hopefully, we're making a final run here in the uh, in the in the Smart Series, powered by Pacematic as well. Um, but you know. You have such a history with racing. You have such, and we've talked about it a little bit. I don't think we've gone into your racing career, but you know, people know you even more just from not just your racing. And we're sitting here right now at the, at the travel plaza and above your head are all these pictures of your brother, Elliot standing on top of his nationwide car winning. Where was that? There's a picture right here. He's That's Phoenix right Phoenix. there. Yeah. And he's got his hands raised in the air. He's got his Coca-Cola in the right hand. Yeah. And all the confetti's raining down. The team is ecstatic. Are you in that picture? Over there. Yeah. Are you anywhere in that picture? No. Okay. And then behind you, behind your head, is a picture of him giving the thumbs up where he had made, gone from the round of 12 to the round of eight in the Xfinity Series chase. Yeah. What year was that? Dude, I don't have any idea. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, he looks younger than he does now. And uh, no, we all. <laughs> but, you know, at that time when he was running Xfinity, you had established yourself as a Fox Sports analyst. Not just there, but weren't you on, like, uh, Speed Channel? It was Speed Channel when I first started. And ultimately, it became Fox Sports 1. And also, for a time there, we were doing DirecTV Hot Pass, which was a package offered by DirecTV that... On during the cup races themselves, you had a 
an analyst that was, you know, assigned to a particular team, and we did a back, you know, a, like a like a behind the scenes deal for the whole race for Directv. But how does a guy for, from Emporia with your accent? How what do you it, mean by that? Of Emporia. What, 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 what do you mean by my accent? What do you, huh? I couldn't understand what you say. <laughs> Help me out, Chef. He's looking at me thick. funny. He's it's a little thick. He's looking down his glasses like his dad does. Oh. You know when you're in. That, yeah. I'm gonna just talk to you <laughs> later. <laughs> <laughs> <How about that? laughs> yes, sir, Mister uh, Sadler. Yes, sir. But I mean, how did you go from driving? You're helping your brother. Yeah. You had a race team. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, uh, you burst on the scene because I remember you on. They used to have that panel on Sunday mornings. Yeah. Kind of like they do for college football. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you were like huge. I was only shot with, out of uh, in the beginning, like Jimmy Spencer. And was Darryl that your Walker? first gig? With speed? Well, let me tell you, uh, obviously, to your point, with my accent, uh, I never planned for a career in television. Uh, I just never thought about it. N it never crossed my mind. But I'll tell you how it started. I was actually in Michigan racing. I was racing a cup race that weekend. And so cup cars and ALCA cars were, and I'm going to say this was... 2001, two, right in there, something like that. Um, the Cup cars and ARCA cars were in Michigan. Xfinity Series cars were in Kentucky, separate from us. And one of my best friends, still to this day, but certainly back in those days, even before I got into television, is Artie Kempner. Artie Kempner is still one of the uh, lead directors for NASCAR on Fox. He's been there. He's done the Super Bowl. He's directed Super Bowls, but he's done the Daytona 500. A lot of work with Fox. He's been in TV his whole life. He has uh, a son with autism named Ethan. <clears throat> so when Haley was born and diagnosed, uh, Artie immediately became kind of a confidant and supporter, helper for Angie and I as we were trying to navigate the early days, months, and years of, uh, of of Haley's diagnosis. But we had just, this was already Saturday. So, like, back in those days at Michigan, we'd have a Saturday morning cup practice, <clears throat> then a happy hour Saturday afternoon. After the Saturday morning cup practice, Artie Kempner comes to the garage. I just think he's coming to, to BS, and he says, look, I need a favor. I said, what you need? He said, I need you to fly to Kentucky tonight and do TV for the Bush race, the nationwide race tonight in Kentucky. What? And I said, what? <laughs> he said, well, something's happened. Out of the blue. I, right, right out of, something had happened. They had a plan. They had somebody was going to do it. Something messed up. And um, I said, Artie, <clears throat> I've never done TV before. And he said, well, that's why I want you to go. And uh, I mean, you obviously have a face for TV. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I just mentioned the accent. So he I said, what kind of clothes you got? I said, he said, you got a sport coat? I said, no. You got a button up shirt? No. Nothing. So they went shopping, did all that while I was still practicing. So after Saturday afternoon's practice, I got on the plane with Daryl Waltrip and Phil Parsons and whoever else was doing it. And we flew to Kentucky. <clears throat> And um, nervous? No, no really? expectations. I didn't. I didn't know. Well, any I mean, better. you've been in front of the camera. I guess I didn't know what I was doing. Didn't interview. know any better. It didn't matter to me. Okay. Um. But I and they had me in the booth. It was, I was not on pit road. I was up in the booth. Uh, color commentary, big time. So, um, we went and did the race, and I just I said, "What do you want me to do?" And they said, "Just talk about the race, just like if you were watching it at home." you know, on the, in the den, make comments, whatever. And so I did it and flew back to Michigan. Well, how'd you do? Wait a minute. I mean, you weren't scared. You weren't intimidated. No. Obviously, you did pretty damn and we, good. We were really late. And who was with you in the booth again? Walter? <sighs> Bill, I'm, I want to say, I don't think Rick Allen was on the scene by the end. I don't remember. Okay. Um, but it was on FX. I remember the race itself was on FX. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, <clears throat> so we flew and we got there late. I mean, we got there and we were changing 
scrambling. We were doing all that. And we got there maybe 20 minutes before we went on the air. And so we start. They ask me a question. I answer it. We talk, whatever. And um, did the race. We flew back. I got back to my boat at home like at 3 o'clock in the morning or something and got up and raced the next day at Michigan. And wow, maybe two weeks after that, you know, a guy named Chris Long, we used to call him Muscles, but he was head of talent relations for Speed Channel at the time. So Chris Long calls me and says, hey, we thought you did a heck of a job at the Xfinity race or nationwide race, whatever it was called back then. We'd like to have you more part of the TV team. So the next thing I did was they had me on the speed race day, pre-race show yeah. for a while. Which is the Sunday morning yeah. round table. I did, I did some of the, the work up at the, at the booth, at the, at the round table with Jimmy Spencer, Darrell Waltrip, Kenny Wallace, John Roberts. That, that was a hoot. And then, then it, they ended up putting me <clears throat> kind of in the garage with Wendy Venturini and some other people that I was. Wait, you had Jimmy Spencer there with Kenny Wallace. I mean, those two guys are nut jobs. Yeah. Hilarious. But you know, and ultimately, they put me on the inside because y'all probably would never understand this. <laughs> no. But <laughs> Studi. race car drivers can be kind of, in a nice way, finicky, but can be funny on race day about their routines right. and who they talk to. And, and this, this race day pre-race show was about going in the pits, going in the motor homes, going these, you know, getting the story, you know, kind of like what Michael Waltrip does just when he's running down the, uh, yeah, but they wanted, the they and, wanted to be in the motor home. They wanted to be <clears throat> in the pits. They wanted to get the behind the scenes stuff. And these, you know, and a credit to my relationships with some of these people, you know, if you called, let's just say Denny Hamlin's PR person and said, Hey, we're going to send such and such a reporter to talk to you at nine o'clock in the morning, race morning. PR person's job is to say, no, shield the driver from everything. You wouldn't get a whole lot of stuff done, but they would call me and I say, look, we really like to talk to Dale jr. So I wouldn't even talk to the PR people. I just call a text Dale jr. And say, Hey, I'm coming at nine thirty. Let's shoot the breeze. He's, okay, you know, really. So I was able to get get a lot of stuff that um, they probably wouldn't. Have maybe got. not everybody would have been able to get. So oh, stroke bill. Yeah. So oh, okay. it's called respect. Oh, is what it's called. Too. All right. Hey, but he looked at me funny when he said stroke too. It was kind of creeping me out. So I did that. <laughs> you know, I, I started off at the, at the at the at the desk, and then I went to the pits, and then started doing features. Now I'm fast forwarding ten or eleven years. Now you're talking about a, a a busy time. So then I transitioned from that over to doing pit road reporting for the truck series. Remember that? Yeah. I first went to Muscles, Chris Long, and I wanted to cut my schedule back some. I wanted to slow down a little bit because I was still racing some. <clears throat> then all of a sudden I'm doing the pre race show on Sunday, and then I'm doing Direct TV Hot Pass during the races. Then I'm doing the speed TV post race show. So you went from zero to sixty just like that. So then, then when I started doing the truck race broadcast, there was about a, I'm gonna say from 2010 to 2015, 16, I was just doing more than I could do. Give you an example. Yeah, I remember going flying to Des Moines, Iowa. Yeah, what's your what's your normal day? Walk us. Yeah, what I'm saying. Or normal week. In this particular weekend. The truck race was on Friday night in Iowa. The nationwide race was on Saturday night in Iowa. And the cup race was Sunday in New Hampshire. So I flew to Des Moines, Iowa. Commercial? On, or did they fly in private? On the NAS NASCAR charter plane. Okay. So that particular weekend, I would drive to Concord, North Carolina on Wednesday, get on the plane, fly to Des Moines, Iowa, have a work day on Thursday. Friday, work all day, qualify and practice, do the truck race Friday night. Saturday, work all day, prepare, do the Xfinity race TV Saturday. Then I would fly back to Concord, North Carolina, Saturday night, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, land in Concord, drive to Statesville by 5 o'clock in the morning and get on another plane to fly to Loud, New Hampshire, 
Holy to God. do the pre-race show on speed. Wow. And then do direct TV hot pass during the race and then do the post-race show on speed after that. Then that night fly back to Statesville, North Carolina. I'll fly out. Dale Earnhardt had a, a but a 30-seater plane. TV people would buy me a seat on it. So then I'd get back at midnight or so Sunday night then get up and then on Mondays back in those days I would take the John Boy and Billy radio show right I taped that and then got back home on late Monday night and start again on Tuesday and Wednesday wow and I did that for probably really only home for a couple days two days a week back in those days that had to be tough it was there's no way I could do it anymore you know and it got it got finally I went to them after maybe four or five years of doing this because I had no life at all making a pile of money but just no life at all it was really bad and you weren't involved in Sadler Oil Um, not to no not 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 not, nothing like nothing like now okay Um, but I finally went to him like in 2015 and said I just want to do just the truck races so ultimately they transitioned me Really, just the truck races, yeah. just the inside. That's all the I wanted to do was do truck races because that was twenty five races, two, uh, two, two days per deal. That's fifty days gone. So five days at home, two days gone. Yeah. And even though you know that, in terms of national audience, that's the smallest audience in the racing week. But I helped grow it. Thank you. Of course you did. <laughs> I watched it because of you. I mean, yeah. you were you were funny as hell. No, but I, I had to have some balance. You know. I had Haley at home. I had a, I mean, just the same old thing we talk about yeah. all, the all the time. But I, but I, I didn't want to stop doing the TV, but I, there was no way I could do the four or five days a week that I was doing at that time because it, not only was I gone from my family, it was just too much. I mean, I was running on E. Hermie, I remember when you first started TV, and I don't remember what year this was. You called me. You on the way to Charlotte. You said, hey, let's meet up at Brian's for dinner, which we did. But Hermie was on the way to Charlotte to take some TV speaking lessons. I don't know if you remember that or not. <laughs> but they were trying to teach you how to cover that accent a little bit. What? As well as, I remember you used the word inflection. It inflects your words. Do you remember that at all? I mean, what, what was that like having to go to school to talk on TV? Well, I didn't. Uh, Chris Long ultimately at some point in time in my journey came to me and said, Just be yourself. No, they came to me and said, we want to send you to speech therapy. The The network <laughs> wanted to send me to speech therapy. Told you, Billy. Well, the rain in Spain falls mainly on the plane. How would you say that? Well, let me return this text message real quick. Oh, okay, Tony Troy. <laughs> <laughs> so, his phone went show. off right in the middle of the <laughs> podcast, <laughs> and he answered it. Yep, that's the way it does. Oh, it was great. Um so Chris uh, Muscles called and said, look, we want to send you to speech therapy to, you know, try to clean your, your accent, your dialect up, you know, for da 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 And I said, you know, I don't want to do that. And I, and I remember telling Muscles on the phone, I said, I'll tell you what you do. <clears throat> you fix Larry McReynolds' accent, and then you call and talk to me. <laughs> I'll work on mine <laughs> And ultimately, uh, I never went, and I just... The big, but the biggest thing that they taught me to do, and and you, I could hear it like I would when I first started. I would go work a race, do a race, and then when I got home the following day or whenever I got home, I'd watch it back. And the biggest thing that I did that I needed to do better was I talked too fast. You know, you don't really realize it when you're talking and you know just sitting there having a conversation. But but I noticed, but when you're trying to call a pit stop. And you've only got twelve seconds, five or six seconds to get in what you get in because I don't get to have it the whole pit stop. I got to send it to somebody else to cover their section. Mm-hmm. I sometimes tried to talk too fast and got too much. Try to get too much in, and it wasn't always. Um, so once I learned to slow down and just be myself and realize that mistakes that I thought I had made on TV, once I watched them back, nobody else would have even known it. Then I settled in and got a rhythm going, and it wasn't hard work for me at all. I, I've said, and I said for the 20 years, basically, that I did it, that Fox paid me to travel. They paid me to travel and be gone from my family because the work itself, 
I kept up with it anyway. I was in the garage all the time. Right. I was racing. I knew everybody. So it wasn't like I had to do a lot of manual labor, but I had to be gone. And you're not a reporter. You're one of them. Yeah. So it had to be I, a little easier. I mean, in, in terms of effort, I you uh, had to get, have advantages. Other but people I just, did. I just, um, you know, I, I did it for close to 20 years in one capacity or the other. And then, uh, 2015, I scaled back to just the truck races. And then ultimately, um, at the end of 2019, I actually brought a three year contract home with me from Homestead or from Phoenix. They gave me a, a contract at Phoenix and I brought it home. And I had always told Angie and my family that when I got to where I wasn't excited about going to the airport every week, that I would, it'd be time for somebody else to do it. So, and I was ready for change and, uh, my dad needed me here and the timing lined up, you know, right for that to be the time. So ultimately when I did my last race in 2019, I didn't really know it was going to be my last race, mm-hmm. uh, because I decided kind of after the fact, uh, but at the last truck race of the season in 2019 was my, was my last race. So you don't miss all of those commercial flights with you sitting in the middle I miss coach. my I miss my friends. I miss seeing. I spent for from nineteen ninety two to two thousand nine in one capacity or the other. I spent more time with my racetrack family than I did my own, mm. and I have a lot of wonderful friendships. Bill, you've seen some of these friendships oh, yeah. of these people to come on the podcast yeah. and other and you've parlayed things that like that to having guests here that yeah. otherwise I couldn't talk to. So um, and great people, great but, but, people. But I I finally the, the travel was too much. So. When you look back on that scrapbook of your life and that chapter that you had, like what's one of the greatest moments that you were a part of either history or something that sticks out in your mind as one of the great things that made it all worthwhile for what you were doing at the time? Well, no really particular event, um, but I was put in a position where I could help some of my friends who were in the, I could help further their racing career by knowing how to talk to them, how to interview them, how to make them present better on TV, even the younger ones. You know, a lot like of the who? young people would come up, you know, even back in the day, like Eric Jones, when he first came in the truck series, I mean, he wouldn't say anything. Interviews were horrible. You know, so I would, I, I'd finally get to a point where while we're waiting for the TV to come to us, I'd be like, you know, trying to joke with him, loosen him up. I'm going to ask you this, say this. I'm going to do this, say that. You know, trying to, help them grow mm-hmm. uh, on and off the track. And so that that's what I really liked about the truck series was I mentioned earlier about, you know, some of the guys in the cup series being prima donna type, you know, not wanting to be talked to all the time. And the truck series guys and girls wanted to be on TV all the time. And they didn't know how to do it. <clears throat> they, they knew yeah, being on TV coming stars yeah. in there. was going to be good for their sponsor. And for Harvick them, started some exposure, some of the greatest you know, started. so uh, that part of it. So I took a lot of pride in, and helping whether it's talking about a win or whether it's talking about somebody's sponsor or talking about somebody's future plans for their team or making their, cause I still do it today. I look, look at people and ask some of these new guys in the truck series. When I watch them, I'm like, what a terrible interview, mm-hmm. you know, and you got to have the whole package. So your interviewing skills can affect how good or, you know, how informative something is. So some of the special moments I had, you know, I got, there was a time, I don't remember the year, I'm sorry, I'm all the everything runs together, but there was a time when Elliot was going through, my brother was going through a, a difficult time. He was going through, he talked about a little bit on the podcast, you know, the Everham and mm-hmm. stuff, things when he was, didn't know really where his career was going to go. And that is Elliot Sadler 2.0. Right. You can find that in our so library. It's a he, great he, he went, Both you know, of those are. The Everham deal went sideways, and some other deals came along, kind of went sideways, and he was kind of wondering if his career was going to be over, and I think he even said this on the podcast, one of the races, if not the race, that turned his career back around was the truck race he won at Pocono. He jumped in a truck for Kevin Harvick, and it was kind of a last minute, you know, throw it together kind of deal, and it was the first truck race ever at Pocono. And so some came up with Harvick. Harvick couldn't run it, whatever. And so he called Elliot and said, hey, hop in there and go. And Elliot won that truck race at Pocono and beat 
and there were some other cup drivers in the field that day. I remember Casey Kane was in the race and some others. And Elliott was pretty dominant in that race. And that led to him eventually getting one main financial and getting back in the Xfinity Series car and going, you know, probably extended his career 10 years um, wow. after that one race because he was, you know, you, it's hard for people to really understand, but you can be in a case like he is, have won multiple races in all divisions, but all of a sudden you're wondering, can I do it anymore? Right. You know, am I too old? Am I this? Am I that? And so in the middle of him trying to find himself, he got in, in that. So I was able to call that race, you know, in, in, uh, on that TV. That special. Yeah. So that, that was special. Now, how do you hold your, you know, I, you see with Dale Jr., he's got three or four cars out on the Junior Motorsports running the Xfinity uh, race, which is the AAA of, to the major leagues of NASCAR uh, Cup. And how do, you, how do you not be the brother cheering and be the analyst given the I never tried not to. A, right, yeah. I never tried not to. So you, you now, were, I can't say you that were I, fanboy brother. I've never been a huge there. fan of like Michael Waltrip owning teams and calling it in the booth and this and that. I, I, but I was there. I called the race. I was myself. When I had a relationship with somebody or thought somebody did a bonehead move, I just said it, you know. And so, yeah, I, you know, you I can't, remember uh, Michael Waltrip went in the 500. Yeah, with Daryl and, 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 and you'll never forget so that. So I can picture like, Hermie doing Come that. Come on, Mikey. Yeah. You can do it. And then that's, of course, when we lost When Darryl. I was in the booth. I mean, I wasn't Same in the booth. Day. I was in the pits, but I did get to do. In fact, that day, a lot of people don't know this, but like you get assigned – like our our producer for the races would assign each pit reporter a section of pit road. I didn't have Elliot's section of pit road that day. I wasn't covering him during the race, <clears throat> but when he won, the producer sent me to victory lane because typically that's great. That's awesome. Typically, you only go to victory lane if one of the drivers you're covering wins the race because you've been covering them all day. You know, you would know where they started, what issues they had, the tires they down, whatever. And you go to Victory Lane and you can talk about the whole day. So I didn't have him uh, that day, but um, Mark Smith, who was the producer at that time, uh, I remember him telling me in my ear, telling the other pit reporter at the time, Hermes doing Victory Lane. So I went and did the Victory Lane with him that day. And how did that really go? Cool. Great. Yeah. What did you ask him? Do you remember? No. Didn't make fun Just, of him? No. Really? I mean, I whatever. But I, I guess my point is I never – tried to be over the top or I never tried to be bland when it came to talking about my brother or a friend or sure. anything You were just else. Hermie. Yeah. You know, in the Sadler name and racing, I mean, that's that's up there with the Earnhardts. That's yeah. up there with the Waltrips. I mean, that's that's a pretty important name. Yeah. And so when a Sadler wins a race. And it was, and it was pretty cool, too. by a Sadler. I mean, I don't think there's been much of that ever in no. time. That's and it was pretty, pretty cool to be a part of the transition. You know, when I first started with – Doing TV, it was Speed Channel. Right. And then that mushroomed into Fox Sports 1. And TNN was there for a while, too. TNN was b before me. Okay. But we went from Speed into F FS1, which is Fox, 24-hour sports, you know, cable sports television. It's kind. Yep. And to be a part of that and be a part of some of those meetings and <clears throat> some of the people along the way, is, was, miss, it was exciting. I miss Speed Channel. I mean, that thing was great. Yeah, but I was and all racing. TV and all those things are not the difference. Was the same, Speed Channel? Speed Channel was awesome. was racing all the time. FS1 was sports all the time, so it was racing sometimes, but it was other sports as well. And some people, yeah. but it it was the sign of the times. I mean, it it, it um, you know, I didn't, I don't, I wasn't in the decision making process. But I guess what I'm saying is, I was proud to be a part of the team that took Speed Channel to a point where they had the, the next step, the next step to get to Fox Sports One, which was in a whole lot more homes than we originally were in. So why don't they have, you know, they have the NHL channel, they have the NFL channel, they have, you know, a lot of the MLB channel. Why don't we have an NASCAR channel? That's you know, I don't know. We might. We might one TV. day. I don't know. Yeah, that would be great. I guess the new TV deal might say that. Now, looking back. Sponsored by Pace. <laughs> sponsored by Stanley Law Group. Are you kidding me? So so let me ask you. It sounds like you got a lot, of, a lot of great memories. What are some of the funny things that you remember when you transition out of being a race car driver you're obviously on the inside because they treat you that way. It's clear that they treated you differently. The race car drivers treated you differently because you knew what it was like to pull the belts tight and, and go at high rates of speed, turn and left. 
What are some of those memories you remember, like funny incidents with those drivers? Well, things that you'd my, like to say well, at a cocktail party and tell a story. Funny incidents didn't really involve drivers. I know the one you always bring up and talk to me about is when I sang with Donnie Osmond. Oh, great. <clears throat> you know, that's a you know, that's a funny thing that you should say that. Hermie Sadler, Pitt Road Reporter, Martinsville, wasn't it? No, Las Vegas. Las Vegas, okay. Las Vegas. Comes upon, you know, he, I think you were wandering around aimlessly or something trying to find something, and here Never. was, <laughs> here was, heartthrob of America when I was a young kid. Of course, I liked Marie, but Donny Osmond, I know many girls back in the 70s had pictures of Donny Osmond in their room, had this week's issue of Tiger Beat with Donny Osmond on the front, and here's this chance encounter between... Hermie Sadler. Well, I don't want to spoil your story, but it wasn't a chance encounter. Really? It was set up? Because it looked like it was a chance encounter. (laughs) My, um, so funny story, um, I was staying at Mirage. Usually when I went to Vegas every year, I had a relationship with the people with MGMs. I stayed at the Mirage. I remember the morning I got up to drive to the racetrack that day, I mentioned my producer, Mark Smith. He called me. He said, you left the hotel yet? I said, yeah, I just left on the way to the track. He said, I need you to do me a favor. I said, what? He says, stop by a store, any store, and buy you some purple socks. I said, for what? He said, just buy you some purple, like, knee-high socks and come on to the track. I'm thinking, oh, boy. So I stop at some Target or whatever the hell's out there in Vegas. I don't remember. And bought me a couple pair of different shade of purple socks. So I get there, and then I go inside the track. So... We would work during the day, and before we would get ready to go do a show, we'd have a production meeting, give us a rundown of the show. and Kind of like we do here. Kind of like a syllabus, yeah, just like we do here. <laughs> yeah, we don't do that. So and then they That's told me, he said, spontaneous and I think it's this fun. was during a qualifying show. We're going to do the, the qualifying show, and Donnie was there as a guest with um, Jay Coughlin, and I think his group with Jig's uh, supply group. And um, he said, Hermie, we, we want you to interview Donnie Osmond. And I was like, okay. And he said, when you interview me, we want you to sing. We want you to sing Puppy mm. Love with him. So this was all planned? This yeah. was all planned? Yeah. Donnie didn't know it. Did you even know oh, the word? Donnie didn't oh, know Oh, heck yeah, I knew. I, well, I knew enough to, 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 I mean, I couldn't sing the whole song by no means, but. <laughs> so I go put my purple socks on, but pull my pants, you know, my pant leg back down so nobody knew. And so Donnie knew I was going to interview him, but he didn't know what the interview was going to be about. So I go. And start having a, just a normal interview with him. And I said, by the way, I think I'm a pretty good singer. Would you mind singing a song with me? <laughs> I think I bamboozled. And uh, well, so I, I gave, actually handed Donnie the microphone and rolled my pants up and pulled my purple socks up. And and I started singing. And they called it Puppy Love. And so oh, he started yeah. singing with me. Hilarious. And we sang a couple of verses. just skipped a beat. Now, hold on, now, hold on wow. a second, ladies and gentlemen, for your listening pleasure. We have that right now. So here it is. I mean, this should have been actually put on to an album, uh, a duet. Maybe it's maybe American it's something, Idol. Shep, that you can play uh, at your DJing because this is a classic, ladies the and gentlemen. Song. This is this is not only listening gold, but it's NASCAR and seventies pop culture history. Here is Hermie Sadler singing "Puppy Love" with the incredible Donny Osmond. I think, personally, I just met you, but I think I've got a chance. In show business, so if you don't mind, you could I maybe you sing like a line for me right now. I, I, could, would you mind? Yeah, but go ahead. All right, can you hold this one sec? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, you're making me sick, Hermie. <laughs> Hermie, you're making me sick. Actually, you know what? To be honest with you, you actually look good in it. Do, do I wear it well? Not really. I'm lying. Okay, can you can you give me a, a beat? And they called it Puppy Love. I knew you were going there. Oh, oh I, I guess they never know. know. Okay. That's ha- horrible. Just horrible. But Marie's I'm doing the best I can to carry you. But I got to take Marie's even worse than that. Oh, good. Oh, so I've got a shot. I've got a shot. Please take it away. Ooh, I think my ears hurt. Man, did tough. you hear him say that I was better than Marie? He he did say that. That was <laughs> that was pretty impressive. What do you think of that, Shep? Shep, is that something you would play at a wedding reception? Uh no, a divorce maybe. <laughs> divorce reception. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty good, though. Did yeah. that get How you on the cover of Teen Magazine? Yeah. Was Hermie yeah. ever on Teen Beat? So uh, that was a, that was a fun experience. <laughs> um, another couple things that I thought were funny. Um, 
the, the year we went out to Texas Motor Speedway, whatever year it was when they opened up the new Cowboys Texas Stadium, yeah. Jerry World. Jerry Jones. We went out and did a uh, did a, 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 a segment for race day. That was you and Rutledge Wood. Me and Rutledge Wood. We were kicking field goals and throwing passes and having a ball. Tackling we each other. We went into the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders oh, locker wow. room. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So uh, and there was no other cheerleader in there. <laughs> no. She goes, right? Oh, you still buddies with Rutledge? Oh, yeah, I talked to him a lot. Yeah. We yeah. got to get Rutledge on because that Hot Wheels show he's got is really cool to watch. He's funny. Right? Yeah. My kid loves it. Chandler loves it. So that was fun. The uh, visiting Jerry's world. No, wait, wait. Now, <laughs> that good. is some of the most pathetic football I've ever seen. I didn't see. I mean, you said kicking field goals. I did not see I any remember, ball cross the bar. I'm not sure if we had it <laughs> as part of the clip, but I remember. <laughs> so Rutledge and I had the cameraman with us in the car as we're driving up because we want to see the big stadium. Oh, yeah. So the first thing we do, we sing the like song. like nine-year-olds. Yep. The stars at night. Are big and bright, deep in the heart of Texas. So that's how it started. Yeah. And then the funniest part to me of that is these girls that were working outside, like take, ticket takers and whatever. Then you, we walked past them and just went up the escalators to get into the building. You know, and Rut and I had this thing. They'll never let us in. And I remember Rut saying, "Just pretend like you know what you're doing." <laughs> so we went right on up there, like we were supposed to be there. And see, Rut said, "You know, I told you just." Pretend like you belong. They let you in. And one of the most fun things I did, the interview wasn't great <clears throat> because of lack of personality by the person I was interviewing. <laughs> but one time we were in Vegas and um, it was a big fight. One of the Evander Holyfield, Mike Tyson fights it was coming out again, yeah. coming through the window. And, um, <laughs> and so they, you know, I get, I get all was the, this pre ear bite. Was that the ear bite? I, bite? I wish I could remember all that, but I can't. Um, but I remember we had we had Evander Holyfield on the pre race show, and I interviewed him. We talked about the fight coming up, this and that and the other, and then Mr. You know, Personality. Yeah, he was nice, but not real deal, Evander Holyfield. Yeah, not not, not a over the top with yeah. emotion or yeah. you know personality. But I remember not like uh, you. I remember I gave the microphone to one of my producers walking with me, and I did the old you know Fred Sanford used to love to watch Sanford and Son. You know, he used to throw the, Up and put, stick his little knuckle little out like a little peek oh, yeah. at day, and I was Sticks throwing knuckles out. around. Go the right and right. I remember saying to Evander, like, <laughs> look at it, I said, sir, do I intimidate you in any way? And he's like, <laughs> I can't no. imagine that. You know, I'm going to talk to you later. Do you think that was funny, or was, was he just not humorable? He, afterwards, we laughed, but he, he's one of these guys, a prize fight. He's not going to laugh so straight while we were on the air. Yeah. So but, was that one of your toughest interviews? My, no, I had some... Interviewing Kyle Bush after he crashes on the last lap of a truck race. It's not fun. by far the <laughs> toughest interview. Well, I, I, I can't imagine. He, uh, he just he just wanted to go hide and not talk. Hey, what was the um, interview show you did with the wrestlers? Um, was that Hot Hermes Pass? Hot Seat? Hermes Hot Seat. That was a pretty cool. That was an Impact too. TNA yeah. Impact Wrestling. I did, and that was a thing where TNA Wrestling back in those days wanted to bring out another side. Or personality of the wrestlers. All you could see on a two-hour show was them in the ring. Yeah. So we did interviews and stuff, and we talked about other things outside of <clears throat> wrestling. I did that for about a year. So I remember that. Well, maybe we can find some kind of clip here to put in. in Hermes Hot Seat. If you go to Hermes Hot Seat, you can Google that. Go to YouTube. There's a bunch of. If I, I did it. Samoa Joe and Christy Hemi, I think. Christy Hemi the and, um, and all on you know what we'll Jay do? Lethal. What we'll do is we'll have a show where we just kind of go back through that and see who he interviewed. Maybe use some of those. Oh, clips they were great. I remember you had the NASCAR. We haven't tires. talked wrestling in a while. Yeah. You know they were trying to bridge NASCAR into. I had Billy Gunn course. and Road Dog. Yeah, yeah, where yeah. was that on? Where did you see? Where could you find that? Um, YouTube now, now. Um, but I, back in those days, we Syndicated. did clips of them and showed them on uh, the TV show, yeah, the, the TV. Impact Wrestling TV show, which oh, was on okay. FX, and then it was on oh, cool. Spike TV for a while, all that. Where did okay. you film those? Well, we're going to dig some of that up They had a the place episode. at Universal Studios in, in, a, in one of those um, warehouses were set up for a studio, and for me to do that. So I remember, you know, you, you tell me some good stories every now and then. Some of those we can't repeat because they're so funny. But, you know, anything remember that you remember It's not because they're so funny. It's because they're incriminating. Correct. Okay. And not self-incriminating, incriminating the other person. <laughs> and I understand that as a lawyer. It. Yeah, I understand exactly what that word means. So so in your mind, when you sit back and have a chuckle, when you think back on your on that uh, on that great and storied career that you've had as a as a sports broadcast analyst, what's one of those that makes you laugh when you think about it or the ones you like to to tell other people about to get a good chuckle? I mean like 
at the racetrack? Yeah, like you know, some, well, of, some of my funnest stories are not even at the racetrack. It's some of the like being in Fort Lauderdale with Dale Earnhardt Jr. <laughs> 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 and some about uh, some of our group ending up in the National Enquirer. You know, those kind of things. Can you talk about? No. <laughs> See, is this that after eight stuff? Yeah. You, you cannot yeah. talk about things that happen yeah. after eight. eight p.m. And an interesting conversation I remember between Dale Jr. and the rent a cop at the condo we were staying at. They had a disagreement about how loud the music ought to be. Yeah, what? And Dale Jr. <laughs> may or may not have called him a rent a cop. It's one of those you things. Know, uh, back in Dale's cockier days, right? Yeah. Now, I remember you told me a story about uh, when you were trying to interview. Um, a race car driver that you had actually spent some time with in Vegas, and you had a great time. Kurt Busch. Uh, what? Tell us that story, because that to me is it just it's funny how Kurt the pendulum so, swings here. Um, again, I'm terrible with years, but mid 2000s somewhere in there, I went to um, California, San Diego, to play in Jimmy Johnson's charity golf event. So we had been in Fontana, California. This is one of the times I told you about how how I was off and gone from home a long time. So we had a race in Fontana, California on one weekend. The next weekend was Phoenix, Arizona. So in between those two, while everybody was on the West Coast, Jimmy had his charity golf event in San Diego. So I went and played in Jimmy's event in San Diego. For some reason, and look, Kurt and I raced against each other, and we were cordial, but we weren't like buddy buddy yeah. by no means. But anyway, for some reason that day, um, I got paired with Kurt Bush. Couldn't play golf worth a damn. I'm sure you set a new course record, kind of yeah. like me with you guys. Yeah. So we play golf. Worse. <laughs> so we get done playing golf and had the event that night. We had a fundraiser auction, all that. We get done. Doing that, and Kurt and I have been together all day, having a couple adult beverages, all that. And Kurt says, well, this might have been like Wednesday. He says, how are you getting to Phoenix? I said, well, I've got a commercial flight. It's, it goes out maybe tomorrow afternoon or whatever. You know, He said, come on, go with me. <clears throat> I said, where are you like going? Thing to do at the time. He said, I'm going to Vegas for two days and then over to Phoenix. So I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, very uncomfortable phone call to my wife. I was yeah. like, Angie, I'm not staying an extra day in San Diego and flying commercial directly to Phoenix. I'm going with Kurt Busch to Vegas and then over to um, Phoenix. Maybe. So, um, so we go out there. I call my buddy at MGM. Yeah, come on. So, me and Kurt and his pilot, we fly to Vegas. We get there and we went bar hopping around we went to carrot top at luxor we went to all these other places we stayed up for 36 hours kid in the candy store mm. never went to bed and so i'm thinking you know i oh mean kurt and i we're tight you know <laughs> so we stay for a day and a half in vegas never go to bed so we get up friday morning and we fly short flight from vegas over to phoenix not even an hour on kurt's plane and we get there <clears throat> and I was having Phil Parsons or somebody who was flying commercial bring my rental car to the track because I was flying with him and didn't I wasn't going to be flying home with him so I needed a rental car and be able to get back to the commercial airport so I had all that worked out a lot of logistics so we landed and I rode with Kurt to the track in your rental car in his rental car okay and my luggage in the back and all that so we got there. We had a very early morning practice that morning. I was doing TV in the garage for the Cup Series practice. Kurt at that time was driving the number 78 furniture road car. Sure. So first lap of practice, Kurt hits the wall. Bam. And Kurt, I was not, a, he was not assigned to me. The Shetmar sound effects are great. He was Keep not going. assigned to me. He was assigned to whoever was doing the other side of the garage. So whoever does the other side of the garage, I hear him telling the producer, Kurt's not going to talk. And so my producer says, aren't you and Kurt buddies? I said, yeah, well, yeah I flew with him over here because <laughs> yeah, we need to go talk to Kurt. So after all this, I go over to Kurt with the, with the microphone and the camera. And he looks at me and he says, uh, on the oh, other side, I'm sorry. Got to take a break Pass here. Pass the deli he, to the left. The owner of the truck stop had to. 
point where the bathrooms were yeah. to a patron. Full service. That's why we get Diamond Dealer Award. Yeah, you tag all <laughs> Anyway, so I said, um, I'm, uh, yeah, Kurt and I flew over here, no problem. So I'll, He's my buddy. Y'all get the button ready, but I walk over there with the camera and the thing and look at me, and he says, why the f- would you want to talk to me right Beep. now? <laughs> and uh, I said, and that's it from the garage area. <laughs> and uh, so that really, best interview. I understood it, but it really made me mad. So once we went to commercial, I went to Kurt and I said, it ended up being a positive experience, but I went to Kurt afterwards. I said, just letting you know that since you declined to interview me and talk at the way you did, as long as I'm doing TV, I'll never interview you again. I'm not doing that. How do you react to that? At the, at the beginning, he didn't say anything, but later that evening or maybe the next day, we got together and he apologized. You bitch slap out. We were. I just said I'm in charge yeah. in a lot of ways of who gets put on TV, who doesn't. Right, which is important for the I sponsors. I will never too, right? talk to you again on TV as yeah. long as I got anything to do with it. Wow. And uh, he was a little bit of an interesting guy back in those days. Calm down. Later in life from, you know. He was one of the hated drivers early on, but was loved towards the end. Yeah. What did you think about his retirement under those circumstances? Um, I, ha- I hate it that I'm he didn't get to go out on his terms. Yeah. Yeah, that's always bad. But Kurt's one of my favorite people now, and we can laugh about that episode. Now. Hopefully and, we'll get him on the show yeah. in a future episode. Maybe we can ask him about it. I'm sure, <laughs> as my father used to say, no matter how thin you make a pancake, there's always another side to it. Sure. That there might be two stories. We I didn't rep- misrepresent anything other than. I'm not going to talk about anything that happened while we were I in Vegas. I was just talking about the Vegas part. I wasn't talking about We're not talking about pits. anything related to Vegas. <laughs> Bill, we you didn't know, go to Vegas. You know that lady that just asked with the restroom, she's going to blow that bitch up. <laughs> she looked like she just had three foot long chili dogs. <laughs> the food is good here at the uh, Sadler Travel Plaza in South Hill. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, th- I think that's a, a great <laughs> She might be sitting right on there. the hand dryer. I didn't realize. Yeah. I, I, it's a lot more stories that I have we'll get to. Well, we got to talk about another part. Because, yeah. I mean, you've got a wealth of stories, and you tell us about them when we're off the air. And I think some of the people, the ones you can tell, would love to hear more of them because it goes back to it. I want to ask you one question on the way out. It's a quick uh, rapid fire here. Uh, rumor has it Southside Speedway, you and I have been concerned about uh, the survival of Southside Speedway, actually bringing it back in Chesterfield County. Uh, you and I were talking to politicians who had approached us. Uh, I was approached as well about you know the future of it. Seems like now at least the rumor or, or uh, Denny Hamlin has uh, articulated that perhaps he would like to step in and try to save Southside Speedway. What's your opinion of that, Hermie? Well, I would love for Denny to do that, but I unless until I see more than him just talking about it, I don't put much stock in that. It's it's a process that you have to go County. through. High, high population You have growth, to go through a process. But the money's so big, four and a half million is what Chesterfield paid for it. You'd have to put probably another five million or more. Well, Denny, Does that become a winning proposition? I think he, made, he certainly made that comment of having interest in it, but it's hard to take it seriously because he has not approached the county. He has not made an offer. As far as I know, he's not asked for any kind of proposals on what it's going to take to get it back to raceable condition. Uh, and quite frankly, I don't know how serious the people are with Chesterfield, some of the people on the in positions of power, I think maybe we'd like to see other things there. Uh, but I'm going to tell you, about the, redevelopment. the racing community has been standing up and causing a lot of fuss. So this fuss over Southside Speedway could have some consequences come election day uh, in Chesterfield County. Wow. And, and you know what we're seeing, too? You and I know of something we can't talk about. And by about, the way. But there's some of these sh- historic short tracks which are... Uh, which may be knocked down for development, just like Southside Speedway might be the intentions of some. Of you the might not want to mention a name that are in government right now. The 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 person's name that has kind of been more closely tied to Southside Speedway is a guy named Chris Winslow, uh, there in Chesterfield County. Uh, he did reach out to me uh, and asked me to endorse him in hmm. his race for uh, re-election for board of supervisors, That's and I just guy. declined because wow. you just. Out I'm of out of politics, number one, but more importantly, I guess, and I'm, Chris I'm is a good guy. I think he's yeah. too knee deep in this the Southside yeah. Speedway stuff, which gets the emotions going. Yeah, but, but a lot of people are but passionate guy. about it, one way or the other. But my position is, I don't really have anything to offer as far as a real solution. I don't have a vote, and I'm not putting any money into it myself. So there's no need for me to stay. Out. I went over there and spoke, and. I was led to believe that there was a proposal further along than what it was, and I don't have all the facts, and I have nothing to add, so okay. um, if, if Denny or anybody else gets involved, I'll be the first one 
to go over and try to help and, and market and promote and yeah Love and hopefully one like day that. have our open wheel modifiers racing on that track oh yeah, yeah. Wouldn't that be but cool? i'm not gonna awesome. get my name involved in it because i cannot at this time in any way be part of the solution well you know i'm telling you short tracks around not just virginia but in other states are um are becoming extinct or at least a rare species and uh it's hard to make them winners in terms of financially you know viable places and that's the problem right now we've got to be more progressive in terms of making a multi-use venues not just a racetrack that races 15 to 20 weeks a year but has everything from revivals to country music concerts to car shows to whatever you can get to get them to keep going to make money and and i think the nut is just so big over there at four and a half million is what they bought it for and the lady that owned it uh, the widow that i guess owned the track sold off all the bleachers and the flag stand and everything else it's a tall it, task for it's, somebody it's, and, yep. and i heard there's cracking in the asphalt and the grass is growing in between so it's a tough it's a tough route but bill i remember talking right, about now listen, i know y'all try to do this to me before <laughs> i gotta go because Chef, i gotta be in virginia beach. The next couple weeks we'll i gotta go be in virginia beach uh, no i was gonna say i remember talking about after North Wilkesboro, when I was there and talking about the economic uh, impact that yeah. these tracks have Huge. on the communities, you couldn't get a motel room. You could Every fast food was lined up around the building. Yep. It's just so important to the local economy to keep these we tracks do going. We got to do, that's do part, it. That's part of the reason we do this podcast. That's really part of the reason why we have this race team that's been so successful with the drivers, Ryan Newman and Bobby LeBron. If Denny is really serious about wanting to save and bring that racetrack back he is about the only person that i know that has the wherewithal and yeah. the resources and the contacts it's going to take a army not just one person and the money uh, to do the, it and willing to lose the money for a long term over time and yeah. if, if that's really what he wants to do uh, i hope he steps up and does it sooner rather than later because the clock is ticking well and and that's why we do the racing that's why we do the podcast and that's why pace matic has been such an important partner with us they came to us when we were doing the stuff wanted to be a part of it because they're involved in the small businesses they're involved in those communities uh bringing skill games to those areas and they're really making a difference so come out and see us at pulaski uh, county speedway on sunday afternoon you're going to love it. Ryan Newman, Bobby Labonte. You can go down there and meet him, get an autograph. You can meet Hermie Sadler at the Fan Zone. We're going to be giving away shirts and cups and stuff. You're going to love it out there. Don't miss it. And, you know, it hadn't been ra- raining on a Sunday, so I think we can get this race in. Or go to North Wilkesboro on Saturday and watch our two race car drivers race in the pace 18 VA and the pace 39 Stanley Law Group. So are you going to be there, Bill? Yeah, I'll be there. All right. And what time? What, what time does the fan be? zone open? Uh, fan zone is going to open around noon, and the race is going. Y'all see you talking? Going? Hey, you have to. Finish. I have a Wait hard a exit at two o'clock. To finish with the- I told you I've got to be in. We we're just having a little Virginia conversation. Virginia Beach at five o'clock. It's not oh, really? about you for man. a shell motiva dinner. <laughs> I thought it was hey, a surfing they, competition. Wait a minute, why do they call it motiva? I thought it was shell. So love y'all. Love you, mean it, and goodbye. <laughs> I'm Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley, and I'm leaning right out of this booth and getting in my car because Hermie's ending this thing. I mean, you're leaving quick. I'm yeah. turning left out the front door, leaning right and turning left with Sadler in the Senator. Powered, Powered by, by pace matic God bless you all. Hey, it's Conrad Thompson with SaveWithConrad.com. You've heard me bragging on the podcast for years about helping people save money on their current house. But did you know that I can help you with your next house as well? That's right. We can get you into your next house with zero down. No money down loan programs are still available. And I know it sounds too good to be true, but we can do it for you. And by the way, home ownership is more affordable than you might think. We routinely turn renters into homeowners, and we hear back that their new house payment is more affordable than what they were paying in rent. Why would you keep doing that? Stop throwing your money away, paying for someone else's mortgage, and start building wealth for your family. And let my family help at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit to do this. We can improve credit scores down to the 500s, and it's worth mentioning, we never say no. We say not yet, but here's how. You need a game plan to buy a house, and that's where we come in at SaveWithConrad.com. We'll ask you, what down payment do you want to make? And zero is an acceptable answer. And what monthly payment do you want? And then it's time to go shopping. Find out how easy it is and how affordable it is to become a homeowner at SaveWithConrad.com. 